We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, first episode of uh, Ganga webinars. To welcome everybody and to introduce the concept and the faculty, I'll hand it over to Professor Dr. Rajesh Shetan. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Ashok. Uh, good evening to one and all of you. A special good evening to our overseas faculty, Dr. Farid Kagda. So as you all know, this COVID has changed all of us for the last uh, one and a half years. So there's been many challenges in our life, but I think on one side, we are also having many opportunities. And one such opportunity is to reach out to people far and wide through our webinars. So we have been locked down physically, but I don't think uh, that's a lockdown for our mm -hmm. mental uh, challenges and to also our academic pursuits. So in line with that line of thought, we, everybody at Ganga Hospital, we thought we have been participating in many of the academic endeavors, but why not we have a formal series of webinars? And uh, we have now launched the first webinar. I'm very happy that uh, we are here with it and joining with us in all our endeavors, as usual, is uh, Dr. Ashok Sham and uh, Ortho TV. Thank you, Ashok, for being uh, with us. And the format of these webinars is going to be that um, we will have one webinar every month. And uh, alternate webinars will be on trauma, which, of course, is always a big crowd puller. Many of you are always practicing trauma and it's all, trauma is always interest to of everybody. And in between the months, we will have a speciality webinar. So the next webinar will be on spine on the 28th of July, Wednesday evening at the same time. And the topic would be uh, lumbar disc surgery. Another topic which is of interest to everybody, not just spine surgeons, but not even every orthopedic surgeon, every general practitioner, the most common musculoskeletal disorder is low back pain and this surgery. So for today's webinar, we have chosen a very interesting topic. Dr. Dina Dayalan, our trauma HOD will uh, lead with our consultants, Dr. Ramesh, Dr. Devendra, Dr. Zakaria, Dr. Arun Kamal, and uh, to have a cream on the cake, we are having our good friend, uh, partner with us in many of our academic activities, Dr. Farid Kagda from Singapore. Thank you, Farid, for being with us today. I know it's quite late for you in Singapore, but thank you very much for joining with us. And the topic that we have chosen is fractures of the distal femur, which is a very challenging uh, topic. Now, the webinar is structured in that we are going to have some uh, didactic lectures, but after that, there, is, there are a lot of challenging cases. And we have also got some external faculty. And I thank all of them for joining us so that they will join with us in the discussion. And I'm sure that this will be a good learning experience. So welcome to all of you again, and thank you for joining. And over to you, Didi. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> So this distal femur we have chosen to begin with because um, we have had proximal femur done already before, but uh, next in the series, I thought distal femur would be better. And then from then we'll cover all, nearly all the fractures that are of great interest to orthopedic practice. Now I hand over to our uh, visiting faculty, that is uh, Farid Kagda, who is our great friend, he is a AO. Uh, chairperson in uh, Singapore, and then he has been instrumental in guiding us also. Thank you, Farid, for coming over. I now I hand it over to you for the first talk to be delivered. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, Dr. Rajsekharan and uh, Dr. Didi, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, warm introduction. Um, 
I uh, and the invitation to speak uh, about distal femoral fractures um, all the way from Singapore. Uh, I put up this slide to show you all the nice sites in Singapore uh, and uh, invite all of you warmly to come and visit Singapore because it's completely empty now and we have no visitors. Our economy is also, you know, it's dependent on visitors. And uh, when you are able, we uh, will welcome you to Singapore with all these things, uh, hopefully in the coming year. Um, yes, I, I work in this hospital in uh, Ang Teng Pong Hospital, which is in the west of Singapore. And um, come and see it. It's, uh, looks nice, like a condominium, that's what most people say. And then they're still looking for the hospital after they've gone past the condominium. Then they'll come here. Distal femoral fractures um, uh, uh, can be uh, difficult to manage and controversial and becoming more controversial nowadays. And uh, I'm just going to give you an introduction talk about these fractures in terms of uh, some basic things as well as decision making. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my uh, fellow colleagues, uh, previous residents who uh, have contributed to the lecture uh, what I'm going to cover is the anatomy, deformity, and radiology in brief of the distal femur. And then, um, you know, my own take of the classification of the patient, very important. Please always know your patient and the fracture that you're dealing with. Uh, some principles and uh, the basic implants used to manage the uh, fracture. And of course, we have uh, so many speakers following on, including uh, Dr. Didi with uh, more details and they will go through the details. And then uh, I will show you some very simple algorithm on how to make some decision on managing them and we'll summarize. And let's start. So in terms of the anatomy, um, we do know that the distal femur is a funny shaped part of the femur. It's trapezoid and you have some good bone stock to put in these uh, screws for your distal fixation. Do note that the uh, plate usually is oblique when you put it lateral, it's never lateral. And because of the trapezoidal shape, if you add in the screw and you do image intensifying, your screw will look like it's in the bone but it's sticking out on the medial side. And it's not a problem until the swelling comes down two weeks later, and then the patient will have issues. So always uh, be very careful here. And it's very easy for you to go through the notch of the femur if, uh, and you won't be able to see this on your, you know, AP view of the image intensifier. So please do be careful. For the femur, we know that we want to restore the coronal alignment and the mechanical axis. And it's a very important part of the surgery of the distal femur that you need to restore this anatomy. Right. Uh, when the distal femur fractures, uh, there are a few things that you have to work against uh, to reduce the fracture. And that's the deformity that's caused by the muscles. Uh, of course, the bone will shorten because of the tension of the quadriceps and the hamstrings. The adductor muscles may move the fragment into varus. Uh, and of course, the gastrocnemius causes the flexion deformity of the distal fragments. But one more deformity that's often forgotten is the way the condyles, when they're split apart, gets deformed. And when you're trying to reduce them, you need to in the axial plane, rotate one condyle in a counterclockwise or the other condyle in a clockwise con uh, formation to reduce them. And we often forget to do this and struggle with it. So do remember that what you're laboring against or working against when you are reducing and trying to fix these fractures. Right, uh, radiological assessment. Uh, here you can see from the plane x-rays, sometimes it's easier to uh, view the x-rays after you've done some reduction and in initial spanning external fixator in the very severe injuries. And look here. Here you see a lot of comminution, especially on the medial side, which is uh, 
something you must pay attention to because that is a harbinger of a meat of various collapse of your construct if you try and fix it. So pay attention. There's a lot of medial comminution and be worried about it. Of course, look for the intra-articular split. Nowadays, we don't stare the x-rays very much. Uh, and also look for this fracture, which may be a, what we call a, a fracture in a different plane. And that's the Hoffa's fracture. And very often nowadays, in fact, in my center and in Singapore, we probably would routinely CT scan all these fractures uh, to see and look for the intra-articular fragments, whether there's a Hoffa's fragment and how much comminution there is on the medial side. But these are important things that you must pay attention to because uh, they relate to how you're going to manage this patient. Now, we come to the uh, part uh, that I classify the fractures. It's not a very traditional classification, but uh, something for you to broaden your mind rather than an AO classification, or I know you have Ganga classification and scores and so many things, but just look at the different fracture types. To me, uh, undisplaced fracture or a fracture in a non-functional limb or an unsalvageable fracture, this patient uh, with the fracture had a serious vascular injury that couldn't be salvaged. That would be one type of patient or one type of distal femoral fracture. Uh, don't forget some distal femoral fractures can be pathological and you may need to not miss this and think that it's traumatic because the management is not the same. Uh, of course, the open fractures and you know, you are watching a webinar from Ganga Hospital and you will learn everything about open fractures here by one of the fellow speakers. So I won't go too much into this because uh, we know Ganga Hospital is one of the leading uh, places to manage open fractures. And then you'll have the common fractures that you see, which will be closed fractures of the distal fem femur, which is common and that you'll be commonly managing. And now starting to be more common, you know that uh, everybody has a knee replaced or will have the knee replaced soon. Uh, and this will be uh, more and more common. And I know you have a younger population in India, but in Singapore, we have an older population, 20% elderly. And I think we're getting more periprosthetic distal femur fractures than uh, young people with distal femur fractures. So that's how I look at the different types of fractures because they would each be managed or may be managed differently. And that's how I <laughs> simple classification in terms of the etiology of the fracture. And then I look at the patient. Well, you should always, you know, base your, never base your treatment based on the fracture alone or the x-ray alone, but also understand the needs of the patient. So we have a uh, bit bound patients or very poor pre-morbid condition patients who may be in a wheelchair, may not be mobile. You may want to treat them differently from the young adult patient or the elderly patient. In the elderly patient, uh, uh, distal femoral fractures are akin to proximal femoral or osteoporotic hip fractures. They have a higher mortality. There's an imperative to walk them as soon as possible. Otherwise they defunction. Fixation is very difficult because the bone is osteoporotic. Uh, your strategy for treatment will be different. Then you have your adult patient, which I think will be the biggest group that you may be seeing. And you will have a lot of talks on nailing and plates and lock plates and so many different methods of uh, fixing them and the biggest group with open fractures, which, which will have the commonest treatment. So we move on. What are our goals of our treatment? Early knee range of motion is important. They're often intra-articular fractures or they're close to the joint and they will cause a lot of stiffness and disability. And to do that, you want to restore the articular surface very important, the limb length and alignment, especially in the coronal plane. Soft tissues, uh, not a big deal in the closed fractures or in the low energy fractures, but a lot of open fractures need the management of the soft tissues. Uh, the stable fixation, so that's where the big discussion will be in the following lectures. And I think in the elderly, there's an imperative to start walking them as soon as possible. And uh, I'll show you some examples on how this can be achieved. Uh, the principles of management, 
Of course, there is an articular component which uh, requires uh, accurate reduction, open reduction, leg screws to allow the movement, but more and more in some elderly patients, you may put a new articular surface, uh, artificial articular surface for them. Think about it, it is an option. An extremely expensive option, and uh, but something to think about. For the metaphysis and diaphysis, uh, the current concepts would be to preserve the blood supply. You don't need anatomical reduction and uh, absolute stability, but you must get the alignment right, often by indirect means and allow biology to do its uh, work. So you see this, it's been fixed in a bridge fashion, lots of combination, and then uh, you see good healing if you don't disturb the biology of the fracture, if you can preserve the vascularity of the fracture. Implants wise, I think there'll be a lot of discussion, so I won't go into it, you have nails, plates, which we talk about locking plates, uh, buttress plates and leg screws. And of course you have the uh, traditional DHS and angle blade plates. But I want to highlight some uh, things about double plating, which uh, used to be in fashion, went out of fashion, it's coming into fashion again. I speak of fashion here. And a uh, combination of nail and plates. And I'll give you some examples of why they may be useful. External fixation, uh, often in the open fractures or the very severe fractures. And also there will be some cases that may not have an implant if they're non-functional and uh, undisplaced. Don't forget those bracing. So let's start with the undisplaced, non-functional, non-salvageable types of fractures. Uh, it may be a bed bound patient, a patient with severe diabetes, infection in the foot already, uh, you know, uh, or it could be an undisplaced uh, fracture in a functional patient that you may want to do something about. You could do cast bracing or put a brace on the patient. This is a very traditional cast brace um, that can be used that allows knee movement after the initial uh, immobilization. Amputation may be an option. If the patient is bed bound, it's easier to nurse the patient, but it's socially and uh, a very difficult subject to approach, but I've done amputations for some of our bed bound patients with uh, distal femoral fractures. And it may be better for them than fixing the fracture, but a very tough subject to broach. And actually above knee amputation can be functional. In this 70 year old man, he can still walk around with a frame and this uh, 30 year old man can still go back to his factory and work with the prosthesis if you cannot salvage the limb, all right? Don't forget those options, but not something we commonly see. Pathological fractures. So if you have a pathological fracture, I think you have to be careful to differentiate them. They may have prodromal symptoms of pain. They may hear the crack before they fall uh, and are unable to get up or just fall down after the crack. And the x-ray looks a little bit uh, more thin. Uh, the pathological fracture can be a secondary from somewhere else, most commonly, or can be a primary. And don't forget, sometimes they can be a primary uh, a tumor. The primary tumors, of course, we will leave it to the oncologist to salvage and amputate. I won't belabor the point. And for the metastasis, it is still a fracture that we may manage. Uh, it may come to you uh, and you may want to do palliation for this patient. And uh, Palliation involves intramedullary nails with cement or putting a plate if it's very distal to cement or if the patient has a very poor prognosis, but give them three months to walk around and spend time with the family. Um, so for example, this is a bit more proximal, but it is a, a metastatic tumor from the lung, adenocea. Uh, patient had some pain for three weeks, fell a crack, unable to stand up from the chair and uh, you nail it and um, allow the patient to walk for the rest of his life as palliation. If, it's the, if the lesion is very distal and the patient has uh, good survival 
one year. Nowadays, tumor, you know, breast cancer, they can live for another five years. Uh, but you may not get a fracture to heal. So you may want to put a prosthesis or get a colleague who can put a prosthesis if they can afford it. Uh, do note that putting in the cement is quite important for the longevity of your implant. Whether it's a plate, if it's distal or a nail, removing the, the tumor and filling it up with cement will give a lot of stability. It's almost like a bone supplement. It's fairly permanent. It can last you a year or two for the lifespan of the patient before the construct fails. So do keep that in mind as an option. Of course, we have the open fractures. You can see the gas in the soft tissue around the CT scan. This patient had an open fracture. And uh, I'll just go through very briefly about the external fixators, one or two things, but the management of open fractures will be discussed in another lecture after this. Initial management, of course, is antibiotics and the debridement. And you stabilize the bones with an x -fix. Now I prefer x -fix right anterior. Uh, many of us are taught to put x fix laterally on the femur and anteriorly on the tibia. I like to put the external fixation anteriorly completely. And why that is so, you have the whole lateral surface to do your plating and reconstruction without interference of the x fix pins, and you can leave it on uh, to add on a distractor or to uh, use the x fix for length while you're putting in your lateral plate and your reconstruction of the joint and uh, your plating. It's very convenient. It maintains the length, you can manage the wounds, and you do your spanning, you scan, you do a scan, plan your surgery, and treat the open fracture by open fracture principles, which will be discussed in the next uh, one of the following lectures. What about closed fractures? In closed fractures, um, if you have an extra articular fracture, of course, uh, if you have two choices, the nail and the plate, and you'll have a, quite a bit of discussion on the nail, retrograde nail, lock plating, the bone and the bane. Dr. Didi will talk to you about. And uh, that may be sufficient uh, lateral plating for the femur or retrograde nail for a young active patient with good bone after the reconstruction. But do think about the patient who is older. There's a lot of medial comminution osteoporosis, many of these fractures are very close at the level of the patella almost, uh, you know, and how do you reconstruct this to allow these elderly patients to walk early? And you may want to consider dual plating, plate nail construct to make it stable and have sufficient fixation uh, for them to walk. Of course, the intra-articular fractures, are the more challenging ones, uh, plating is usually standard for these. But in the elderly, uh, already have osteo uh, osteoarthritis of the joint. In uh, many Western countries, uh, the imperative to walk immediately after surgery and go back to be independent as soon as possible may mean one of these processes to be put in. It's becoming more and more common in Singapore, but it is a very expensive and therefore a difficult choice to make. Um, but something to have at the back of your mind if there is a suitable patient and you think that the patient is suitable and would benefit from it and can immediately wait there if you can't achieve that with your fixation. Now for the closed fractures, I want to give you some examples of the dual plating and the plate nail construct. For example, in Singapore, I told you we are 20% uh, elderly and a lot of our fractures and elderly who need to walk around and many of them are still working because Singapore is so expensive. The 70 year old patients, 80 year old patients are still working for their livelihood. Uh, low energy injury, you look closely, it looks intra-articular, it's fairly low. Uh, CT scan shows that it is a comminuted complex fracture. The bone is very thin. Uh, you can see the trochlear lesion separate from the condyle, it may be a separate piece here, one condyle there, another condyle there, maybe some infection and bone loss, uh, very thin cortices, osteoporosis. So you could fix this with a single lateral plate, but would you be confident to walk the patient after that? Tough. An 80-year-old patient, if you think that after fixing the proximal hip, you should walk them immediately. Should you not try to walk them if you can fix the distal femur immediately? 
how can we achieve that? Go in, uh, reduce the fracture, try and fix it with some screws, the trochlear to the condyles, fix the condyles to the shaft, do double plating, lock plate on the lateral side and a plate on the medial side. I think this medial plate is a proximal tibial plate, put it upside down. Uh, Schwartz buckler approach so you can see the joint right straight uh, 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 here and then the screws that are more proximal can be inserted a bit more percutaneously. Uh, this is what you can achieve through the surgery. Start them on CPM, walk on the day after surgery when the hemoglobin and they're a bit more stable, they're elderly after all. And um, you can get fairly good results. You don't need perfect reduction. You don't have to worry about arthritis after 10 years, but you do need them to walk. Uh, something to consider in terms of dual plating. Uh, look at this fracture. It's a very low energy, maybe extra articular, very close to the very low fracture. Um, uh, how much you can look here on the lateral view, how much space you have for your plate for plating. Uh, two screws, three screws, maybe if you can fit in. Um, in this case, you see a femoral distractor applied for the length. Uh, we reduce the fracture using uh, our surplus wires with this clamp and a plate on the medial side. The plate is put more posteriorly, kind of contours and helps reduce the fracture. And you put it posteriorly so you have place for your nail. And then you could put a retrograde nail for the patient. Insert the retrograde nail. But if you look at the retrograde nail, probably the distal, you can only get one distal locking screw maybe because of the fracture is so low down. So together with the plate, of course, we try and protect the neck to prevent further fractures. Uh, and this is our final construct. Looks a lot of heavy metal. Um, this is the construct for the patient. We protect the femoral neck from further osteoporotic fractures. We don't want the patient to come back for another operation. We think uh, there's sufficient fixation distally. We allow the patient to walk with a frame. At six months, it's healed and the patient can mobilize the knee and walk, even though they have arthritis, the knee is stiff from the beginning. But uh, we get them walking early and out of the hospital as soon as possible. Uh, there are some unusual fractures. Please don't miss these. These are not a Hoffa fracture associated, uh, isolated Hoffa fracture. Take a look at the x-rays, very small uh, fracture on the lateral condyle. Look at the CT scan. What do you notice? You notice a bit of metaphysis of, attached to the fractured condyle. You can do a buttress plate and leg screws so that you are more confident on moving the patient and starting the patient on mobilization early rather than just having two leg screws for this. Uh, and this uh, plate can be a very simple plate and still allow full range of flexion. Of course, we have the distal femoral replacement, um, which is shown uh, to allow immediate weight bearing if you're worried about your fixation. Um, it's better than revising your fixation to a TKR but never as good as a primary TKR before a fracture. Extremely expensive, uh, only for the really older patients. So let's come to the periprosthetic fractures. What should we do? Periprosthetic fractures uh, for uh, the distal femur, you have the rollerback of classification that helps you tell you whether the sufficient bone stock and whether the implant is stable or not. So stability of the implant. If the implant is loose or needs revision, of course the treatment will be revision by revision surgeon. Um, but if the implant is stable, then you have a chance of fixing this fracture. You need to know about the implant. Is there an open box for you to be put in plate? Otherwise, if there's a stem or the femoral prosthesis is a closed box, it is plate. Now these patients are usually elderly. They have, uh, there may be very little bone stock distally. There may be medial comminution. They are osteoporotic and they need to walk and rehab. 
again, can these uh, dual constructs help you achieve that, give you the confidence to emulate the patient? So an example, just look at this fracture, it looks fairly simple. Uh, spiral fracture above, uh, well, fixed, stable. To the prosthesis. Um, uh, this butterfly, maybe this lateral piece that you see, the proximal fragment, uh, maybe just reaching the box, and the larger part is the medial fragment. So there may be at least three fragments here, and you may have very little purchase uh, of space for fixation distally. Uh, what can you do? if you want to walk this patient, you may, if you put a plate, yes, you can get your fixation. And then you may ask the patient to go on crutches and hop about this 80 year old lady, maybe tough. Um, even if you put a nail, how much distal fixation could you get if this prosthesis actually allows for it? That may be tough. Huh? So what did I do? Standard lateral plating, you can see. Uh, put the plate distally, clamp it down, have the plate proximally, put a wire. Uh, this is what it looks like on the table uh, using a distal femoral locking plate. Uh, this is the view on the lateral side after the plate is in and with the outrigger. I have this, uh, this is a very useful device, this metal bar. We have it from our Tomofix uh, set, but you can just use any metal bar. What does it tell you? It tells you the alignment of the limb. Have I restored alignment? Center of the hip, center of the ankle, or less, center of the knee. You should get your mechanical alignment and restore the coronal plane alignment uh, when you're doing this without having to open up very much and get your alignment. And it's a good thing for you to check in most of your distal femoral fixation to see that you have achieved the mechanical alignment. But I was wanting more fixation to allow this patient to walk because my goal was early ambulation. So I got a femur and put it in a plastic bag that's sterile, put a template, contoured a medial plate, very long medial plate, inserted it. Um, this is the medial incision. This is the proximal, more or less uh, anterior medial incision. You have to be careful of the vessels, of course. Uh, lateral incisions for the screws, lateral incision for the lateral plate insertion. You can achieve, even in a minimally invasive fashion, dual plating, walk the patient from the next day. It heals very well. Lots of metal, uh, minimal damage to the soft tissue, faster rehab, and we need to send our patients home as soon as possible. So that comes to my uh, end of my talk. Uh, with regards to decision making and some uh, new things, uh, sorry, a little bit over time. Always think about the patient and what are the goals you want to achieve. Which patient is this? Is it the non-functional patient, the elderly patient that needs to have early weight bear bearing, patient that needs palliation? Or is it a young patient that you want to start running again? Do keep that in mind. Uh, in the type of fracture, don't miss your pathological fractures. Don't treat all fractures the same. Open fractures require a different uh, approach, closed fractures, intra-articular fractures, the periprosthetic fractures. And then you have this choice. The main choice is to fix. But sometimes you may want to replace or sometimes you're forced to amputate, which may be the better choice for the patient. Uh, do pay attention to the amount of comminution, especially medially, osteoporosis, how much bone stock you have to fix. And think about heavy metal constructs. I don't know if you're interested in heavy metal music. And our aim is the early rehabilitation of the patient, not the healing of the fracture, not the, uh, that's, those are supplemental or intermediate aims. The final or main aim is early functional recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Farid. So you have covered extensively and we have spoken about every aspect of your distal femur fractures that come in our practice. 
so what we also wanted to listen to us uh, listen to in this decision making was like how you exactly you define like for example when there is a fracture coming in sometimes we tend to use a locking plate sometimes we tend to use a retrograde nail sometimes we can also think of anti grade nail fixation so how do you decide on these types of fixations all right i think um that's um something that i tried to show you i i think that in terms of uh, plates i think in uh, the standard nowadays is using locking plates and by the default uh, it is uh, the locking plates that are our standard of fixation so that should be your default choice a lateral locked plating of your distal femoral fracture because we know that outcomes between uh, plating and nailing of the distal femur are similar the next thing that you need to consider is the medial comminution so if they think there is medial comminution uh and you think nailing uh plating is a lateral plating you may need to add some supplement whether it's a nail or another plate if you feel that there is sufficient fixation distally in an extra articular fracture with enough fixation for your nail you have to judge or plan this very carefully if you can you know um in the distal femur it's very wide canal and your nail has maybe two locking options or three interlocking options now if you can get good fixation enough space for those three interlocking options uh, is an extra articular fracture your nail is enough but for a lot of fractures the fracture is very low you are worried can you have sufficient locking options after inserting the nail and thus i think your standard should be plating and even with the plating you are able to achieve a lot of stability to allow the patient to mobilize and ambulate early if you take into consideration some of the factors i have mentioned in the lecture so default option locking plate sufficient extra articular and sufficient uh, bone for distal interlocking you could use a nail but uh elderly patients osteoporosis bone poor bone stock supplementary fixation extra plate to your nail or to your plate how about that is that simple enough yeah it's very simple and you made it clear also i think keep it simple otherwise uh, there's just too many options yeah, yeah. so actually it is uh, actually you have covered extensively the distal femur and also like for all our post graduates they would definitely understand all these and then like you also put in a good good perspective of what are the different decisions that you have to make in distal femur so thank you very much so we'll move on to the next lecture and i want uh, ramesh to tell about the role of retrograde nailing in the current scenario because you see farid kagd also said the choice of fixation should be locking plate to begin with so let us see what ramesh tells us about Good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parit Kogda, for our extensive uh, coverage. And also, you have given the judgment about the nail and the plate options. So, my talk is going to focus on uh, retrograde nail because recently, because of the invention of uh, locking plate, it has been like an extensively used, and nails are slowly the usage has come down. Now we are. Uh, in a way to promote the retrograde nail is also a better option and it has to be in a permanent member of our armamentary so this is an example of a young adult following a high energy injuries you can see a c2 type of a distal femur with an articular comminution extensive metaphyseal and uh, diaphyseal comminution so the treatment options are many as i told about the starting from uh, condylar buttress plate to the DCS to the distal femoral locking plate. And as you see, the options are uh, many in these situations. But uh, this was the procedure done. So as you can see, it is using uh, as a bridge fixator. And the plate was uh, a thirteen hole plate. As the principles of uh, locking plate commonly used are 
you have to measure the length of the comminution and the plate has to be three times longer. So, in the screw density is 0.5, it is the principle of a locking plate. Here you can see the, even though the reduction looks satisfactory, but the principles of uh, locking plate are a uh, bit inadequate because of uh, short segment uh, proximal fixation. As you expected in the early post operative period itself, there is a bending of the plate because the principles of uh, locking plate are not uh, followed enough in the form of uh, spanning the plate and screw density. If we take a similar kind of uh, distal femur fracture in an adult, a similar type of an um, C2 distal femur, there is an articular comminution with an extensive metaphyseal and diaphyseal comminutions. So in this injury, so we have done an uh, inter, uh, retrograde nail, initially an articular fixation with the condylar screw and then uh, following retrograde nail, at the end of uh, three years, she had a good functional outcome. The fixation was biological and early knee range of motion was started and patient had an uneventful outcome. So when the principles are followed in good enough, both nail or plate are going to give a better result. So as you all see, locking plates are uh, most commonly used in the recent times. Of course, there are a good outcome in uh, many situations when the principles of locking plate are uh, followed in justice. So there are uh, many articles regarding the pitfalls and problems of uh, locking plate. There are reoperation rates that are up to 20%. And implant failures in the form of uh, loosening of screws or breakage of plates are common up to 7 to 10 percent. So, locking plates have got a uh, very good advantage of it is a ease of application, user friendly implant, and it has got a uh, multiple points of fixation of the distal femur. In the retrograde nail, the option of multiple points are lacking, but the newer implants are evolving. As it has been mentioned, it is acting as a bridge fixator and the internal external fixator. It spans the fracture, it improves the working length. And it allows an early callus formation and followed by weight bearing gives a good uneventful results. But the disadvantages of locking plate are it is not good for uh, middle comminution and void as been mentioned by Dr. Farid Kakta. Hence, when you weight bear early when the principles are not followed, it might cause a problem in the form of an implant failure or non-union. As you all know, locking plate is a load bearing device. Hence, there are complications like uh, plate bending and screw loosening and non-unions are common. In contrast to the plate, retrograde nails have a better advantage of it is a load sharing device. So it maintains the both the length, rotation, and axis of the affected lower limb when it has been done in a principal manner. And also the reaming has got a positive effect on callus formation. So the endosial reaming has a positive effect on callus formation, which is much uh, predominantly seen on the medial side. However, there are disadvantages of a retrograde nail also. Because of uh, minimal locking screws, there are insufficient articular fixations uh, is the problem, which might require an augmentation in the form of uh, missing the nail. We have to put a cancer screw in the anterior posterior thing, or we have to use a special interlocking nail with the multiple locking options. Since it involves the intraarticular thing, the chance of uh, knee stiffness is also common. When the nails are not uh, properly inserted, the techniques have been not followed properly, there is a chance for a uh, malreduction. When the screws break, the nail might protrude into the joint and in some situations, there may be a breakage of the nail at the hole or in special situations, uh, as Parit Kogda has already told, it needs a buttressing plate either on the medial or lateral side in presence of a circumferential comminution in the metaphyse and diaphyse regions. So here is an example of an uh, A3 type of a supracondylar femur with an intact distal femur and a medial comminution. The procedure would be following a radiolucent table and a bump under the buttock and the triangular pillow or bolster is very important. Depending upon the thigh girth, you can use the uh, bolster or a triangular pillow to get the uh, nail entry. The very important thing is screening the hip and lesser trochanter at the beginning to look for the deformities of the proximal femur as in many times there may be an excellent rotation of the proximal femur. So you might use a Steenman pin to rotate it and on the similar time you have to screen whether the hip is visible in the CR. Sometimes the uh, hip region might be obscured by the, uh, the radio opaque uh, table. So you have to make sure the hip is properly visible so that you can, at the end of the procedure or during the procedure, you can make your axis from the hip to the ankle where it has been 
told previously so that we can have a good anatomical and mechanical axis have been maintained the approach should be a midline approach either it's a medial or laropetral approach is indicated depending upon the comminution when when you have a comminution on the medial side you can go for a medial parapetral approach or like a swash swashbuckler approach you can go to lateral parapetral approach so you can address the corresponding condylar comminutions first key is the reduction of the articular fragments and provisionally they can be fixed with the k weights or steenman pins once our reduction is adequate then you can go on to the entry into the nail and the nail can be inserted the entry point for the thing is 1 cm anterior to the pcl origin is the entry point where both the intercondylar sulcus it is in the center in both an ap and lateral view in an ap view that has to be centered in the metaphysis when it the guide wire is inserted and uh, the guide wire has to go along with the anatomical axis centered in the metaphysis once the guide wire is confirmed we can do the reaming reaming has got a very good positive effect here the medial butterfly fragment was reduced with the 4.5 reduction clamp and a circlage wire was uh, applied so you can see the reaming and also the regarding the nail length it has to be at the secondary level it has to cross the intercondylar sulcus and proximally the nail has to end at or above the level of lesser trochanter to prevent the stress raising at the sub at the subtrochanteric region hence you can see the circlage wiring and the two distal locking screws are purchasing into the intact femoral condyle so patient can go on for an early weight bearing marking and also the early knee range of movements can be started in special situations like a morbidly obese female with an osteoporosis and an extra articular distal femur fractures the nail is going to work well because the exposure and also the stability of the implant is going to be much much higher when you are using a, a nail the locking plates are uh, in osteoporotic individuals are a bit high even in uh, using a locking plate you might use the the bicondylar or a plate as the farid has already told for better mobility and the fixation we run with a distal femoral nail with the spiral bed option so that the patient can have an early weight bearing walking and the range of movements can be started this is another example of a c2 distal femur fracture with a more amount of comminution you can the ct scan is also showing the fragments more on the medial side hence we did a midline approach a medial parapetal arthrotomy was done and the provisionally the fragments are fixed with the k wires and the steenman pin then our entry was started the centered in the metaphysis in the ap view and also in the lateral view and the guide wire was inserted once the locking has been done in the proximal and distally the articular fragments can be fixed with an cancellous screw and here the the medial hoof of fragment and the anterior side was fixed with the headless compression screws and you can see the articular congruity is well maintained and the post operative x ray you can see the alignment of the limb length and rotation axis were maintained and patient was uh, encouraged to do early weight bearing walking and encouraged to have a good amount of range of motion in the knee this is another example when patient who had an a polytrauma with uh, multiple fractures this patient had a chest injury and also in a bilateral distal femur fracture and a head injury where the principles of uh, damage control orthopedics in the form of an uh, external fixer is applied in the initial phases then it was uh, plan for uh, fixation both the sides in bilateral femurs for an early weight bearing walking a nail pit concept works well because of extensive metaphysical comminution here on the right side uh, there was a focal comminution hence we added an endless nail for an uh, structural support on the medial side and lateral support the medial spike was uh, more into the diaphysis hence uh, nail pit concept was uh, advised and here you can see that one year follow up both the fractures have healed well as we started the early range of motion patient has got a good functional outcome therm of knee bending and also patient gained a good uh, outcome the other thing is an uh, open distal femur fractures where the uh, the metaphyseal bone loss and there is an extensive intraarticular involvement the as per the initial protocol a debridement and uh, the loose fragments were removed since in the intraarticular fragment we put a following a wound debridement we did a primary plating and the bone gap was filled with the cement spacer in the initial stage and the wound was closed primarily so in 6 weeks as there is no evidence of infection the cement spacer was removed since there is an extensive metaphyseal and diaphyseal comminution with the circumferential involvement and loss of uh, bones so we added a nail pit concept we added a tricortical uh, graft on the medial side 
and a nail bed construct was done on early range of mumuthu in kresh if you can see at the end of one year patient had a good functional outcome in the form of range of movements and also the non eventful outcome the commonly available retrograde nails are uh, the conventional nail with an uh, interlocking screws and with the, the locking bolts into the thing and multiple locking screws and a distal femoral nail with a spiral bed options and then the conventional nail with the multiple locking screws are available at present the cadaveric studies with the multiple locking screws with the locking plate has showed a conventional nail has got a longer fatigue life than the locking plate and the locking nail has got a superior uh, fatigue failure when compared with the interlocking screws so there is another study which compared all the four implants the conventional nail with the locking bolt and also the distal femoral nail and the commonly used angular staple locking plate and in the first thing the torsional stiffness were more with the angular staple locking plate but however you can see it is the the, the supracondylar nail with the multiple locking option as and parallel with the uh, angular staple locking plate for the rest of the axial stiffness cycles of fail all the things the retrograde nail with the multiple locking options have got a, a better stability than the angular stable locking plate hence this paper has concluded that the angular stable locking plate has significantly higher torsional stiffness than other construct but with the intra the retrograde nail with the four screw distal locking has nearby comparable lesses with the angular locking st- angular stable locking plate our the four screw locking uh, screw considered the highest axial strength followed by the plate and the other things this was uh, comparable with the human cadaveric bone and also it is similar with the synthetic bone models hence the retrograde nails with the multiple locking screw has got a biomechanical more stable than the locking plate there has been uh, many literature of uh, minimal case reports of 20 to 30 patient some studies say the locking plates are more favorable and also some studies have reported that retrograde nails are more favorable but the meta analysis on comparing the larger studies the regarding the blood loss and operating time infection malunion and non union and knee stiffness and the other problems and there are no significant difference in the complications compared to the nailing and plating have been uh, quoted but they have suggested the randomized control trial also this is another study incidence of uh, non union after uh, distal femur fractures using both the contemporary fixation the nail and the plate There has been 38 cohort studies have been included and 2000 more than 2000 factors have analyzed but they concluded that only 5% developed non union and there is no difference in the outcome but they concluded that you have to master in one of them you should know the balance between both the implants and then whatever necessary you have to use that type of an implant hence to conclude the intramedullar nail will have its permanent place in armamentorium because of the versatile usage and retrograde nail works better in extra articular and metaphase diaphysical comminutions and the newer implants with multi locking screws are biomechanically superior to locking plates and in special situation you might need an augmented cancellous screws or a uh, add add of uh, locking plates in special situations like metaphase diaphysical comminutions so thank you very much for your patient listening thank you ramesh so it was wonderful follow up with the locking plates and uh, first decision making and then now to let uh, everybody know that retrograde nail is still a viable option in special indications especially those you have pointed out yeah. those which are extensive combinations i feel that nail is still the best option so farid what's your take on this so uh, i think um he has uh, brought up this very point right so in the case that um, you know there is not much difference that can be shown in the statistics between the nail and the plate uh, but the important factor is in the complex fractures you may need to have supplementary fixation uh, each may not be enough and it is the locking options in the distal femur that is important you must have sufficient locking options in the distal femur to support your nail there must be sufficient bone stock there uh, and uh, you have a special nail with more locking options or you have to supplement it so i think uh, uh, he's shown that very well so we we'll love a final this is, this is the type of cases we you see in singapore we have a bit of a slower type of uh, case a bit more relaxed 
No, the reason I also wanted is because now for every fracture, now people started using only the locking plate. Sometimes the in the in their mind the re retrograde nail doesn't come up also. So that is why the locking plate failures also we see in many literature. So that's why I thought it is it is our decision making that is very important in these situations. Yes. So I think uh, another thing that he has shown is that when not just extensive combination, but a lot of fractures were in the shaft also. They're a combination of distal femur and femoral shaft fractures. And uh, once you have such extensive fractures, these are not just distal femur fractures. Uh, many of them, if I look at it, I, I, when I look at a fracture, um, I look at the epicenter of the earthquake that, that caused the fracture. If the epicenter is in the shaft and then it's extended into the distal femur, you're right, the nail, maybe a better option because that's the better option for the shaft of the femur. But you need to supplement to make sure that the distal femur is sorted out. Yeah. So we'll, we'll move on to the next lecture that will be by me. So Ramesh, can you yes. come out? Yeah. So. No, I chose the topic uh, locking plate is a boon or a bane. The reason I chose it is because of the same point that I wanted to bring in because locking plates is widely used. In the bargain, the other implants is slowly getting forgotten. So I thought majority of the implant failures that happen is also because of indiscriminate use of locking plates. I think if you, if you use locking plates wisely, and follow all the principles that both Farid and Ramesh Purmal has put it in, there should never be a problem. Suppose if you have a fracture like this elderly patient, and then there is a long spiral fracture, you know that once you have a locking plate put in, and then you can also use, because it's a pre-contoured plate, you keep it in position and then slowly bring the fragment to, into position with the, you can also pull the fragment to the plate and then get the reduction done with a good traction. I, I'm sure every one of you will get this type of reduction and fixation. It's a fairly simple type of a fracture. And also if you apply the principles like all the screws in the metaphysical region, 0.75 is the ratio. And in the diaphysis is the 0.5 is the ratio. Minimum three screws must be there. That is six particle purchases. And if you use it, and then in between at the fracture site, if you have three holes that is left free, then it is one of the best fixation that you can ever get. So if you do that with the good principles of fixation, I am sure all the locking plates would work. But unfortunately, the fracture pattern may not allow you to do it every case. So sometimes you may have to use little plate that is shorter than what is expected of the three times the combination that you choose. Sometimes in a simple fracture, it is said that eight to 10 times the length of the fracture site is the length of the plate that you must choose, but that may not be always be possible. So having said that, if you take this picture, if you take this, it is not a, exactly a distal fracture that you think of as a locking plate situation. In fact, for this type of fracture, probably retrograde nail would be the best of the fixation that you can choose. However, you see, this is the plate that has been chosen. This is what I mean. See, often you tend to use the locking plates. So the indiscriminate use of locking plates is the one that is causing concern today in the, in the practice that we are seeing. So here you can see if you have used a retrograde nail, probably this would have worked well. But having said that, you are using a locking plate. But you can also see the locking plate has been used fine. But thing is, if you fill up all the screws, then it makes the plate fixation as a very stiff implant. And then there is a point contact type of point uh, loading that happens at the fracture site and it is going to fail. And that's what has happened. So again, you see it is the plate that has been used correct, but whereas the principles are not followed. And that is what is important. And also the indication itself may be a wrong indication. You all know that in our scenario, when we have been practicing from the beginning, you can see that this is a distal femur that has worked well. This, our condylar blade plates have worked well. 
and if you see we have used all the screws this was the principle at that stage and that it went on to heal well so there is no doubt about it that this will heal well when you fix all the screws on the contrary again you look when we were doing open injuries in the early days we were still using all this uh, dcs and then you see we have fixed it and also you see the plate was also not too long it was also a short plate all this worked well when it was like a conventional plates regular plates that we were using but nowadays it is the fixation principles are slightly getting changed but you have to know that what type of plate you are using the biological fixation also was used early days we were using a dcs for a biological plate fixation so it is not that locking plate is newer to you locking plate is something that it has to be understood well only thing you have to know is this is the wagner's article in uh, german language see like the first it was a round hole then we have converted it to a dcs hole then pc fix came and then slowly it evolved over to a combi hole before combi hole it was a list system that came in where it was only the locking screws but for a surgeon to choose a combi hole means in the intraoperative stage he can choose various principles that is the point by which this plate system came in you can use this as a locking plate as a sort of a primary fixation like a dcs fixation you can use it like only for a neutralization plate or various pattern but you can also use it like just like a peri implant fracture situations where it can be used just like a holding plate so very various principles can be used with this combi hole technique so having said that and when this came in what was to be taught was the mini max fixation so that means when this came in when you are using it as a biological principle you have to use it as a mini max fixer that means you have to use uh, it is like an external fixator so stay closer to the fracture say and expand up to the bone so it is exactly the same type of principles that came in and that is what you are using in for a bridge plate principle on the contrary whenever you want something like a non union when you are using a, a locking plate you are not going to use it like a bridge plate you will have to use compression contact and then you will have to make sure that your plate is really stiff and then you have to bring uh, biology everything so whereas on the contrary when there is comminution you are going to use it like a bridge plate fixation so when kreger at all when first he put it in this there was lot of uh, rag 123 fractures you see 96% of them healed well when this new plate came in so with this caught up with the whole world and then everybody started using the locking plate and it really gave a good results locking plates are actually a boon because it is because of the nature it is like it is like a angle stable implant it is uh, you can use it for variety of uh, in, uh, variety of fracture fixations and all the fracture fixation if you use with the right principle i am pretty sure you can use it right and you can get a very good results but you see why i am putting this x ray is because you can see there is an interfragmentary screws that are going in here and then you can see one more screw that is going through the fracture site uh, that is along with the plate and then you see there are two screw that means this is neither a compression principle at the fracture site nor it is like a neutralization plate that you use for example early days what we were using if you use a spiral if you have a spiral fracture like this there will be one screw that is going at the end of this fracture site and another screw at this fracture site perpendicular to the fracture so it has to go at the perpendicular to the plane of the fracture and if you want in between one more screw you can add it so like that we were using like a in, it is like a interfragmentary fixation and then you use it as a neutralization device if that was used suppose if you have done the same principle and use this plate as a neutralization device it can still work well and also re remember like when th this unfortunately because of the pattern of fracture fix fixation it has failed otherwise this wouldn't have failed and also like you remember when in our early days this was the fracture that we have used and this is a, exactly like it is the ganga hospital score if you take it is the 13 that means we have to do a staged reconstruction and here again you see we have done all the fracture fixation but still we have maintained with the external fixator why did we do this with external fixator purely because we know that there was a medial comminution 
we know that the lateral plate, any plate for you to work well, the opposite cortex must be intact. That is the principle that you have to follow. Because you know that there is opposite cortex is not intact and we are using this plate and we have stabilized it with additional external fixator so that it doesn't go in for bending. So if this could be applied at that many, many years ago, what has to be done is the similar principles that we need to follow. So you, you have to use it. Why the advances? You have to think where has the advances come and you have to apply those advances well in all these practice. And this you can see, you can it has gone on to heal well and it gets a reasonably good result. And here, like what is important is now when we are all using the uh, uh, LCPs, a lot of failures are happening and we have found that it is mainly because of the medial void. And if you, there is a medial void, of course, now already Ramesh as well as Parit Kogda has told, it is the dual plate that will work well when there is a medial void. So working length is something that has been ta taught to you. And then I said in the first slide, I said that three holes is generally sufficient for you to give a right elasticity and then it will go on to heal. But you see here, you have multiple holes that is nearly five to six holes are left empty here. And then in our practice, it is so difficult to decide what is the adequate length of the plate that has to be left free so that it is, it is giving the right elasticity. But however, if you see read parents articles very well, if there is multiple fragmentation, suppose if there is a multiple fragmentation, you know that the strain pattern at each of the fracture fragment is reasonably good enough for the fracture healing. On the contrary, if there is a focal defect, suppose only one or one fragment is there, then it is going to be a focal defect. And those are the fractures where you will have excessive stress on the implant and they are the one which will go and fail. See, you can see this has gone on to heal well. And also like if you take any, any, any fixation that you want to do, look at this. This is one of the fractures that we fixed it. Any peri plant fracture, you see like this, any fracture that is with processes, you have to get a right uh, alignment because for the longevity of the processes, you have to definitely get into a correct alignment and axis and rotation, everything must be perfect. So here you can see once you give a traction, lot of the fragments will fall into position. And once they fall into position, you need to completely make sure that both in AP and lateral view, you are securing the uh, reduction. Suppose if there is any alignment change, you can also give a push from anterior or posterior side and then make it. If you make an incision here, what happens is, Suppose if you want to see the entire uh, articular region, it is better your incision is closer to the patella so that you can turn the patella or shift the patella and then get the articular reduction done. Suppose if you are sure that you don't need much of articular reduction to be done, you can stay lateral and then it can be as minimal as possible. Once you do that, so you can see that here we are doing a lateral incision. And then as you incise it, you can see that it is released. And then one of the trick you must also do is to release the in, uh, uh, subcutaneous fascia. If you release the fascia, it will be easier for you to introduce the plate. And then when you are introducing the plate, say if initially itself you check what is the level of combination and if your plate is three times the length of the combination, immediately check it and then slowly introduce it. Always stay closer to the bone. Make sure that you don't wobble anteriorly or posteriorly. If you're wobbling, then your soft tissue dissections will happen. So make sure that you are right on the bone and then as you complete it, go across the bone. And then at that stage, when you are sure that you are on the bone, then you put the pins both anteriorly and posteriorly. You can see that as you are sliding it up, as you stay closer to uh, bone, and then you make sure that the cretex technique can be used where you can put pin anterior to the plate and posterior to the plate so that it remains in position on the bone. So once you are, uh, you can see that I'm um, positioning the wires and then if it, once it is done, you can see that the entire laterally remains stable. And then you know that now you have got a reasonably good reduction. And then now you complete on the distally metaphysis. Why I'm completing it on the distal metaphysis because now plate position was good enough. There is no problem with it, both anteriorly, that is AP and lateral view, your reduction was good. So once the distal metaphysis is secure, now it is question of only the proximally how you get the uh, fixation done properly. And at this stage, when you are doing this, 
you can see that now that I have completed it, and then as I complete the procedure, now I am focusing on the uh, reduction part of it. So once the reduction is maintained, one of the thing is now you saw that in the metaphyseal area, so in the metaphyseal area, you can see there was a gap over here. And then now you have to slightly try to close it off. The plate was also equally positioned. And then when you want to close this, the ways you can also do it is, you can get your uh, one of the screw inside and then try to pull the fragment. But when you pull the fragment, you are also lateralizing the entire shaft. So to prevent the lateralization of the shaft, you can put a small block. You can put a block that is, you can use a Steenman pin, 6 mm Steenman pin or something. Between the femur and the plate, you can put a block and then bring the fragment closer so that now your shaft does not get lateralized. It will stay in that position and then you can establish the medial continuity. So here I am showing it because always remember that the plate, the combi hole is like the conventional screw will be away from it and then the locking screw will be closer to the fracture side so that you have to always remember it. And then based on that, you can also, when you are using the, uh, your fixation, you will be, it will be easier for you to understand that. And then you can see now slowly bring it closer. As you bring it closer, you can see it is, you are bringing it closer and then you can stop it there. As you stop it, then you can go on to the topmost portion and then complete your fixation. At this stage, before putting the proximal screw, what you must make sure is your cable wire test you must do. That is, you have to make sure the alignment is all right. As Parit Kagda has already explained to you, you have to check the hip center, knee center, and then the ankle center and make sure it is completely in alignment. Once that is done, then you complete the fixation. See, this is how you complete your uh, surgery. And then once you complete it, one of the other technique also like when you are using it, the, within the hole that you are using, like combi hole that you are want to uh, check it, and then you, you can use the Steenman pin to get your locking hole properly in position. So you, through the jig, use the Steenman pin and then hold on to the locking hole. So many times you will struggle to find out the locking hole. So here you can see that is completely fixed and then your entire alignment was secured. So by if you follow all the steps properly, then there should never be a problem in our uh, fixation at all. So here you can see that all this uh, locking plate, though it has given excellent results, but there are reports that you, it can fail from, see in the, one of the report, there was 20% failure. Actually it was 40% complication with 20% non-union. And then in some of the, for 25% had non-union rate. And then here again, there is a 22% non-union. So that is, our, our literature is flooded with papers, which also says there is complication involved with locking plate. I feel that the complication rate is higher purely because for anything and everything now, they started using the locking plate for the distal femur. One of the key issues is the mall alignment. So in the bargain of minimal invasive surgery, they all do mall aligned, mall aligned implant surgery. So that is what you have to look, MIS if they take, it is a mall aligned implant surgery. So, but if you follow all the principles, I think you can do it completely well. One of the first principle is that you have to have your, the one of the central screw of this distal plate, this uh, locking plate is that it always runs parallel to the joint line. It is like early days, we used to do what is called the summation wire technique. So that is exactly same like that. You use the similar principle, then one of the screw must run parallel to the joint line. If you make sure it is running parallel to the joint line, that distal fragment gets aligned in this direction. And laterally, it has to run. Uh, that is, if you take the cortex, posterior cortex, distal femur, it must be parallel to the plate. So if you take that, then it should it should be fine. And here you can see that in this fracture, as I said, if many times when they are uh, compressing it, the uh, shaft becomes lateralized and the entire uh, distal metaphase becomes medialized. That is also because sometimes your positioning of the plate. Sometimes if you position the plate too posterior, what happens is it can also push the plate too far medially. 
that is also is important factor that you need to take into account <clears throat> so this is another correction that you have to do so as i said it is a posteriorly cortex must run parallel to the uh, plate uh, line so if you uh, draw the line from the posterior margin of your plate and then the cortex they must run parallel to each other and when you are taking into alignment into account it is also rotation sometimes when there is a rotational mall alignment what happens is the surface area of contact becomes very less and when there is a when that happens again non union will result in and you will have to correct the non union by another technique see like in the beginning of the talk by farid kagda he said one of the uh, uh, or deformity or rather a uh, uh, force that is getting changed that is the displacement that is taking place that is the metaphysis that is widening that has to be taken it is it is also not only rotating the metaphysis also gets widened if you don't take care of it what happens if you fix it in that position it is equivalent to a medial void why i am tell, telling you like this because you see that the shaft is in a different diameter and then the distal femur is in different diameter suppose if there is a splaying if there is a metaphysis that is widened and you keep the, the diaphysis straight still there is contact is not there so that is the reason that it is called it is also like a medial void so you have to correct the not only the metaphysis that is getting rotated but the metaphysis that is the articular margin that is rotated but the metaphysis that is splayed also you will have to correct it if you correct it then there should not be any issue and then it will go on to heal well so this is one of the fracture you can see it has this this fracture has been fixed like this so you can see that it is not only like there is an articular uh, incongruency but also you can see that the metaphysis has not been collapsed there is no inter fragmentary compression that has taken place and also you can see that the other condyle is not held very well itself because sometimes the plate if it is rotated if it is not held very well if the screws are going above that is going superior not posteriorly you know that as uh, parit kagda has put the first picture where it is a trapezoidal shape you will see that when you position the plate all the screw will get directed posteriorly suppose if you don't get tilted in that position if you keep it straight and put it all the screws will go anterior so if you if you are careful about positioning of the plate then this would not happen so you can see that it comes after two years then we will what you have to do is to get it again reduced and then you get the metaphysis to be compressed and then add a fibula and then go on to get it into uh, union and then it goes on to heal well so this is something that you have to understand in the beginning itself so all these principles if you definitely follow well then your locking plates becomes a big boon for our forest to make it heal well on the contrary if it is indiscriminately used then it becomes a problem for uh, that's why i said locking plates is a big boon as well as the bane is provided if your knowledge in treating them is less so what i would like to end by saying is new technology is in good it is it is all about how people choose to use it This is what is the big thing that we need to understand in uh, locking plate fixation. Thank you very much. Farid, you can you can give your comments and then take. We'll go on to uh, next. Um, uh, my comments is that I think you have pointed out all the. important uh, pitfalls or important things that need to be paid attention to in using the locking plate and um i think uh, you're right uh, you know the initial use of the locking plates was uh, well controlled by a few surgeons and they showed such good results everybody started using them in every way possible and then now we have these issues and uh, that's why uh, uh the uh, the locking plate alone is doesn't work so well and people are looking for other ways to supplement it you've got the fibula you've got uh extra plates you've got nail and the plate uh to address the problem and the high complication rate for these fractures and i think you pointed out the very important things that everybody must pay attention to when they are using this locking plate 
and uh, we know that the majority will be using plates because you know uh, uh, um, uh, you know if you have a distal fracture you have intraarticular combination by default you think of using a plate right and uh, most people would do that i think nail is very challenging in those type of situations it's the nail is routine and by default when you're just doing the shaft you know how it is so uh, excellent lecture sir uh, i have a question sir. yes devendra uh, sir uh, many times uh, long locking plates when we apply proximally there is a possibility of uh, lifting up the plate away from the bone surface uh, like a helicopter effect how to uh, avoid how uh, how, to, how we can avoid on table or how to correct on table sir no as i as i showed it in the demonstration so it is it is important that as you push the plate inside it has to be always rubbing against the bone if you are going above or below you will immediately lose the resistance so you yes. have to be slow and then steady and then rub against the bone and then go forward as you go up if you are if you are seeing that it is lifting up it is better to put a k wire at that spot to push it and then you put the k wire at that spot then it will be like a, a road block so that it, your plate will not go up so continuously okay. you keep going it if you if you shove it very fast you are definitely going to go above or below so this happens purely because you are going it too fast okay sir parid you are you can also tell about that. no i think you are absolutely right so there there are two parts to this uh, 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 thing about the plate lifting off the plate goes anterior or posterior to the bone and you have been describing correct the plate mustn't be anterior to the bone shouldn't be posterior to the bone because you also have difficulty in putting the direction of your screws for fixation into a bicortical fixation so that's very important the lateral view but one more thing that happens is that the plate um uh, diverges from the bone in the coronal plane so always uh, the divergence is more when the plate is lifted up or behind or in front but when you get a plate aligned to the bone on the lateral view sometimes the plate is lifted off because we have bowed femurs and uh, you'll be surprised the shorter the patient the more bowed the femur and the more la uh, lateral the plate will be sticking into the soft tissues the only only time it's not a big deal as long as your plate is aligned in uh, is not anterior or posterior to the plate it's a lock plate the plate doesn't need to con uh, contact with the bone yeah not a big issue but the only make sure that the plate is not anterior to the bone which is the most common problem yeah the only time that it sticks out is purely because of bowing so either it could be anterior posterior or medial lateral bowing so that medial is the only thing medial. yeah Sir, I have one more question, sir. Sir, yeah, but Devendra, go on. So, yes, sir. When we complete the fixation at the end of the fixation, we are checking the alignment by using cautery tests. Sir. At that stage, when there is a mal alignment, how exactly if there is a varus, uh, if the center point is quite medial or lateral, how to exactly we can correct whether to remove all the screws and then realign it and then do our uh, any other tricks that we can follow sir so number one of course is it uh, depends on where you have fixed it in the beginning so many times <clears throat> the distal site if you fix it if you have made sure that your screw is parallel to the joint plane generally that segment is you are in control remaining yes, you can keep you remaining you can push pull and then you can also figure it out and then as you do the cartridge test you will also know then you can keep on putting your wedges between the shaft of the femur and then the plate you can move it medially and laterally and then you can get it aligned that is one way of doing it okay. but you see like sometimes this the way that you are putting like a central hole going parallel to the joint line is only in the synthesis plates many yes, other sir. plates it may not happen so one of the important thing you must do is before surgery you use one of the locking bolt and then see what is the angle it forms to the 
long axis. If you know what is the angle it forms to the uh, joint line on the long axis, then fairly you will get an idea as to how the distal screw will go in. And if you get the distal block correctly positioned, then it is you are moving the distal block and the plate together to get your alignment right. So as as Farid Kagda has said, it is not that plate has to be next to the bone. It is the internal external fixator. So it has to be, you can move it away and be closer and then get it aligned. So that is simpler to do. Can I make a comment, Didi? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, Dr. Devendra, I think, uh, yes. you know, when you use the cautery to check alignment, please try to check before you put all the screws. Yeah. Okay. So okay. usually, um, one screw distally and one wire distally, one screw proximally and one wire proximally. Um, check your alignment. Okay. And then okay. make your correction. It will be easy to make your correction then. And you need to have two fixation points, right, on either side before you can. So one wire and one screw, I think, is the minimum. Um, and then you check your alignment. Yes. And then check again. But if you only check after all eight screws are in, I think it's a bit late. Okay. okay. How about that? Something simple. Check earlier. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Dr. Farid, uh, for you, uh, some uh, tips about the medial uh, long submuscular plating. I saw one of your case. You yes. a long medial submuscular plate. Yes. So, um, we, we often uh, do a short medial plating. So that's done open. Yeah. Right. And, uh, but for the submuscular plate, um, actually is fairly straightforward. You just have to be, your plate tends to be a bit more anterior. You have to, uh, if you see my picture, you have to uh, spiral the plate. So get a model get a template uh, piece, contour your implant on the model so that it is uh, in a spiral fashion. It ends up anterior proximally and it is medial distally, right? Now, when you are passing the plate, the only uh, danger is when the vessel, the vessel is under, is on a bed of a muscle in the canal. So actually, most of the time you will be under the vessel and you have muscle separating you from the vessel. It's only when the vessel goes through, uh, past the adductors to the posterior side is where you have to be very careful and be very uh, periosteal or submuscular in inserting at that one point, just above the flag. And then proximally, uh, you are under the muscle, it's quite safe. It's only when you make the holes for your screws from anterior to posterior, just like you're putting in a nail, uh, a retrograde nail, uh, locking screws proximally, you just have to be lateral to your femoral vessels. The main thing is have a model to contour the plate against, then sterilize your plate or have a sterile model. Uh, Distally make a short incision, proximally uh, make a short incision. Be wary where the vessel transits from anterior to posterior. So what implants you feel it is ideal for a medial plate? I just use, uh, because you are, this medial plate is done uh, submuscular and uh, minimally invasive, uh, of course, we are using it in a situation where there's uh, lots of comminution or you feel that the bone is osteoporotic, it's a lock plate. So a standard lock plate, you just need to contour it, get two screws distally, two screws proximally, because this is supplementary fixation, not your main fixation. Should be sufficient, lock screws. Sir, I have a question, sir. Yes, please. Uh, my question is to Dr. Ramesh, sir. Yeah. Uh, in a lot of in a lot of your cases, I've seen you have been passing percutaneous SSY in the distal femoral fracture. Have you ever come across any kind of nerve pulses in all the cases? Because I have a case in which I have tried passing SSY 
पर के चेंज नहीं एंड द पेशेंट हैड अ फुट ड्रॉप लेटर ऑन सो हैव यू कम अक्रॉस सच सिचुएशन बिकॉज़ आई आई डोंट डू अ परकोटेनियस अ लिटिल बिट ओपन अप एंड देन आई स्टे अलोंग विद द पेरियोस्टियम इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इज यू स्टे अलोंग विद द पेरियोस्टियम i used to use the the evo wire passer where you pass the the path creator then you create the thing and then uh, introduce the thing and also i feel the once the the wire pass insert once the wire is inserted i use my fingers in the opposite cortex to direct the little bit bend the wire so that it comes along with the periosteum and the bone so then i take it out i make little wider incision not like a minimal percutaneous i make mm. wider incision for the wire passer at the level of distal femur okay mudit uh, one of the see like in the all this facial attachment is very strong posteriorly in the uh, yes. bone yes, so you have, yes. you have you have to make sure that you slip that along with the bone and then you make sure that you are able to pass the instrument easily if you are able to pass it and stay closer to the bone i'm sure that you would not be getting it so okay sir so that is that that is the trick posteriorly you must release the fascia so if you release it was it, actually a long spiral fracture so i am not very sure because mm-hmm. maybe i missed the foot drop pre operatively that can be an issue mm-hmm. but uh, post operatively the patient had foot drop and almost for a year it was not recovering mm-hmm. okay thank you okay we'll move on to the next lecture by uh, well murugeshan so he will speak on hofas fracture because this is one of the commonly missed sometimes especially in distal femur practice he will explain about us who who was correct good evening sir thank you and uh, i am going to talk on optimal solution for hofa fracture management and uh, the problems we commonly face are hofa fractures are often missed because it, these are coronal plane fractures not easily seen on x rays and uh, we also have problem on visualization of the fracture reduction and getting a stable fixation and in this short distal fragment can be difficult this makes it to makes us mobilize the patient later resulting in stiffness or it can result in mal reduction and failure of fixation so the objective of this presentation is to know various approaches familiarize with those approaches and know when to use them to learn a few reduction tip and to know which implant to choose based on the fracture type so that we can get a stable fixation to mobilize the patient early and get a good fun- early functional recovery as tech- as <coughs> already told in previous presentations so uh, sorry to interrupt dr vail yeah. uh, cannot use the presenter's view you have to yeah that's perfect that was perfect yeah go ahead one minute so this is a yeah. 40 year old gentleman who presented following a road traffic accident and and uh, he had a, a lateral hofa fracture her uh, which uh, excuse me uh, just stop. tap on the slide once with the mouse it will start moving so he presented with pain and swelling over the knee and uh, he was uh, and contusion so when we carefully look at the x ray we see that there is a double shadow in the ap view in the articular surface and we will also be able to see a um, uh, impaction of the intercalary depressed fragment and uh, so it is always we need to have a high index of suspicion and uh, to avoid missing these injuries as nearly 30% of these injuries are missed early so when we look at a ap view we can be deceiving because coronal plane fractures are not clearly visible and it can and the double shadow can be mistaken for a overlap of the patella shadow and uh, oblique views are more helpful helpful in these fractures than lateral view because it is easy to trace this articular surface there is in the oblique view and fine for any if there is any disruption of the articular surface so in 1978 lettenard had classified these hofa fractures into three types type 1 is the one where there is a vertical fracture line which is along the which is a continuation of the posterior femoral cortex and type 2 fractures are purely articular fractures where they don't have any soft tissue attachment and type 3 fracture the fracture line is more oblique 
weak and uh, when we look at the anatomy of soft tissue attachment in this fracture popliteus gets attached just inferior to the lateral epicondyle and lateral collateral ligament gets attached to the lateral epicondyle and gastrocnemius lateral head of gastrocnemius gets attached superior to the insertion of lateral collateral ligament and acl gets attached to the inner aspect of the lateral femoral condyle so when we go to the medial condyle mcl gets attached to the medial epicondyle and it has got a broad attachment to the tibia so when we look at the fracture types type 1 and type 3 the condylar segment has good soft tissue attachment but in type 2 fractures the soft tissue attachments are absent they they are devoid of any soft tissue attachment because they are purely articular fractures and when we look at the blood supply the main blood supply is from the extraosseous blood vessels that is superior lateral and medial geniculate artery and descending geniculate arteries these supply majority of the condyle when we look at the intraosseous blood supply the nutrient arteries are deficient in supplying the posterior aspect of the femoral condyle lateral et al lateral has described this as, as as reported that these fractures that is those type 2 fractures where those involve only the posterior condyle they are more prone for avascular necrosis so our patient and uh, in our patient we find that there is a intercalary depressed fragment this fracture has not been described by lateral so this is a variant of either type 1 or type 2 with intercalary comminution this has been described by robinson et al and uh, this classification by yobin ct based classification which divides the distal femur into three regions a b and c by two lines that is one line is drawn in the mid diaphyse mid diaphyseal line and the second line is a continuation of posterior cortical line of the femur divides the femur into three zones and this classification is based on on fracture line number of fracture lines and the fracture line where it exits anteriorly and the number of comminution and the comminution location in the uh, in the regions so based on these classifications our 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 patient has a lateral type 3 variant where the main fracture line is more oblique and there is a depressed intercalary fragment and um, whenever you select a approach we look at two important things with the approach whether we will be able to visualize the fracture and reduce it and whether we will be able to do the fixation of what we have selected through the same approach so when we do a lateral parapetalar approach we will be able to see nearly 80% of the lateral and anterior lateral condyle with the lateral parapetalar approach and this fracture falls within the 80% so with the lateral parapetalar approach we will be able to visualize this fracture and reduce it as well so similarly when we look at the condyle that is the hofa fragment we see that this fragment is fairly large and it is more than 20% of the 20% of the height of the lateral femoral condyle so when the fragment is large we will be able to get a good purchase with the antero posterior screw fixation itself there are various forms of fixation and biomechanical stu biomechanical studies have revealed that 6.5 mm cancellous screws are a higher load to failure Uh, compared to four uh, higher higher load to failure compared to four mm cancellous screws and a headless compression screws and adding a second screw did not significantly increase the stability however posterior to anterior screws were biomechanically more stable in resisting vertical shear force than anterior to posterior screws but when use when we use a posterior to anterior screw we have to use a headless compression screw and a smaller screw to minimize the articular surface damage and also to bury the screw within the articular beneath the articular surface so whenever the we suspect the patient will take a longer time to heal especially in the presence of osteoporosis the presence of severe comminution and the increased bmi we tend to combine plate with screw fixation plate can be either a neutralization plate or a buttress plate or a raft plate so we tend to use raft plate whenever there is a depressed intercalary fragment which we need to elevate and raft it so the first step is to reduce the depressed intercalary fragment reduce it secure it kys and then with screws following it we use a subcondral plate which we have already contoured with the template 
head templating the lateral condyle and we also fix the elevated screw wrapped it through the screws through the plate and to get a good purchase in the short distal fragment we have to direct the screws criss cross so that the our length of the screw increases and we also get a good purchase there so in this patient we are done we are position the patient supine then an anterolateral approach the flexing the knee helps us in two ways it helps us to visualize the fracture and it also relaxes the capsule and pull up gastrocnemius on the short distal fragment which helps us in reduction and the second step is to use joystick maneuvers where we use a steam and pin in the post anterior fragment and also a steam and pin in the short distal fragment with the steam and pin in the anterior in the anterior shaft fragment we elevate it so that space is created to pull the short distal fragment which has gone posterior to length and match it with the anterior fragment this pins also joystick also helps in controlling the rotation of both the fragment so uh, once we get the length which can be which we can know that we have achieved reduction by properly matching the interdigitations of the chondral surface this can be also known by matching the metaphyseal spike if it is present if the metaphyseal spike is comminuted we can also look into the end on view of the distal femur to see the notch of the distal femur and whether it has been reconstructed nicely once it has been reconstructed we secure it with k wires following which we compress it with webbers clamp and get an anterior posterior screw in and a subchondral arch plate to wrap the elevated depressed fragment this is a follow up at 6 months with a good functional functional outcome so this is a 28 year old gentleman who presented with the lateral fofa fracture here the fracture line is more vertical which is along which is a, like a continuation of the posterior femoral cortex and there is also an extension comminution more posteriorly when we look at the ct it is a type 1 fracture or a lateral type 1 fracture though it is not depressed much there is extensive comminution of the posterior condyle and we find that the fracture is extending nearly to the 80% of the height of the femoral condyle we for visualization as we have already mentioned to select an approach we must see whether we can visualize it and reduce it and whether we must we can fix it through the same approach so in this fracture with the lateral parapetalar approach we will be able to see the fracture and reduce it but to because this is a very short fragment getting a posterior to anterior screw would be a better option and it will provide more stability which will which will make us more confident in doing an early mobilization in some patients where there is a metaphyseal spike adding a posterior buttress plate will increase the stability of the construct so to get this posterior to anterior fixation we may need to use a different approach so here we have combined two approaches lateral parapetalar approach and a postero lateral approach to get the fixation so we position the patient in the lateral position and do a direct lateral approach we were not able to visualize the posterior extent of the fracture in this approach so we did a gaddis osteotomy to increase our visualization depressed fragments were elevated and brought to in brought in position and uh, through the postero lateral approach the plane between common peroneal nerve and biceps femoris we exposed the posterior condyle and got a posterior to anterior screw fixation and postero lateral plating is completed this is the final follow up x-ray so this is a 60 year old gentleman who presented one month later to us with the medial fofa fracture in a following a trivial fall fofa fractures are usually following a high velocity injury sometimes these fractures can occur even with a low velocity injury especially in a osteoporotic patients so this patient presented one month later with severe osteoporosis also so when we look at the fracture we see it is a type 3 fracture with a more oblique fracture plane and the fracture line extends more anteriorly into the condyle so we will be able to visualize with the any anterior approach either medial parapetalar approach or a subvastus approach but since there was a more osteoporosis we thought we will get a better fixation with the posterior to anterior screw fixation and it because and it is more biomechanically stable in resisting vertical shear so we used a extended medial approach for postero posterior to anterior screw fixation so we patient position the patient supine through the through a medial incision and uh, extend extended medial approach is done initially the subvastus is muscle is erased from the is medial intermuscular septum and gracilis 
and the medial retinaculum is exposed. It is incised to see the anterior articular surface. This is the anterior arthrotomy. And then posterior MCL is visualized, identified, and posterior arthrotomy is done just posterior to the MCL to visualize the posterior condyle, which is through which headless cancellous screw fixation is done. And then the neutralization plate is done and uh, is, 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 uh, fixation is augmented with the neutralization plate. This is the final follow up with a good functional outcome. Sometimes um, uh, the more complex bicondylar fractures else are also common. These, uh, are, these fractures are usually seen in open injuries. This uh, animation shows a simple technique to help in aid in reduction, where the, uh, we pull the posterior aspect of proximal tibia anteriorly to reduce the displaced, to help us in the reduction of displaced condylar, condylar fragments. Here, uh, because, there, because there was a patella fracture, it has helped us in visualization. We get an end on view of the entire condyle, reduce it, uh, and uh, initially secure it with KYS, followed by multiple cancellous screw fixation, resulting in a good functional outcome. We do do bone grafting whenever there is a, a large defect following a elevation of a depressed fragment, resulting in a huge void, and, um, and also in a non-union scenario, where getting the length of the condyle back results in a void and uh, which can be filled with the bone graft. In, bicon the, in the special situations, such as in an elderly patient who's already osteoporotic with the severe OA changes, a bicondylar fofa can, under can be treated with the primary total knee replacement. And uh, our post-operative protocol is we mobilize the patient and from the second post-operative day, start on knee movements non-weight bearing for the first six weeks, partial weight bearing from six to 12 weeks, and full weight bearing from 12 to 16 weeks. So in conclusion, and we must be very, have a high index of suspicion not to miss this fracture. And CT scan is necessary to evaluate the, uh, evaluate the fracture, to plan approach and to the fixation. And um, whenever we see a type one lateral fracture, one, there is a large distal, uh, the fracture exists in this fracture, fracture exists more anteriorly and the distal fragment is very large. So only anterior approach can be used for visualization and anteroposterior screw fixation with the neutralization plate would be an ideal option. Whenever we see a type two fracture, which is more posterior, posterior approach for reduction and fixation through posterior anterior screws. When the, the, whenever there is a metaphyseal spike, a posterior buttress plate would increase the stability of the fixation. When there is a variant type with more posterior combination, combined approach uh, with the anterior and posterior approach, anterior approach for visualization and posterior approach for fixation would be ideal uh, way of doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Velmurugisni. It was very clear uh, concepts that we, we have brought in. And uh, Farid, you, your comments, and then we'll proceed to the next thing. I think it was great. It's very detailed uh, uh, analysis uh, of, uh, of uh, Hoffa's fractures, as well as the approaches, examples. Excellent. Thank you. It was clear, like, when to use post approach, how to, how much to visualize, what is the, whichever approach, how, mm -hmm. What is the percentage of visualization you can make? It was an excellent uh, presentation. Visualization is the tough bit, man, with the yeah. approaches that we are used to. And you can't see your reduction. And that part of your discussion is excellent. Thank you. So we now move on to the last lecture. After that, we'll have a case discussion. So we'll move on to open supracondylar, open fractures. Yeah. Devendra will present it. So all the trauma consultants are in, in today here in the department. So I'm happy that all of them have presentations to make. Devendra can go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to talk about the management principles of open digital femur fractures, the lessons learned. There are a various spectrum of uh, open injuries that varies from simple wound to a large wound, both of them which are easily manageable. 
to a, a very difficult uh, to salvage, barely salvageable open injuries of the uh, distal femur. Here, sometimes the wound can be simple. However, the problem of uh, bone can be more complex. And sometimes the uh, wound can be more complex and the fracture can be more simple to manage. Whenever we see these kind of uh, open injuries of the distal femur, to achieve a good outcome, uh, we need to adopt a multidisciplinary approach uh, for complete management of bone as well as soft tissue and also the uh, systemic, uh, systemic injuries of these kind of major injuries. And we need to know at each step from arrival to complete uh, uh, final procedure, uh, how to manage, what to do in casualty, when to do the debridement, whether to salvage or amputate, amputate these kind of major open injuries, and how far we can uh, go on day one, and uh, when to do sec uh, sub subsequent secondary procedures. First, let us see what to do in a casualty. Whenever we receive these kind of injuries, the, if, uh, we need to look at the, how the injury has happened. The kinetic energy that comes from a moving vehicle gets absorbed by the limb when it gets hit to the limb and the whole energy gets dissipated throughout the whole thigh. And here the supraglial femur fracture happens and, it's, and because of the violence, either it gets pushed through the anterior uh, soft tissue rent or through the patella or extensor mechanism and uh, it projects out and it causes a momentary negative suction effect at that moment and then sucks in all the foreign material that are lying nearby to that limb and then they get uh, sucked in into the uh, deeper, uh, deeper areas of the open wound and sometimes it goes inside the medullary canal as well. Here we can see that uh, the bone projects out either through the patella uh, by making a, a two halves of the patella and then comes out through the extensor mechanism. And in these situations, we, uh, first thing that we should not do is we should not reduce the limb, uh, the bone inside the uh, wound. So uh, because the, all the mud, uh, dirt and uh, dirty particles are there uh, over the overlying the bone, they all get uh, again distributed inside the open wound. So always first thing is we have to debride these kind of wounds properly and then reduce the uh, bone inside the joint. And majority of these kind of major open injuries, they often present with polytrauma where associated injuries like pelvis or other systemic injuries along with open distal femur fractures. Here we need to follow the ATLS protocols. Life is first and then limb is next. We need to look at this principle. Uh, ATLS protocols will save the patient and then we can uh, look at the limb, how to manage the uh, open injury. And uh, in these kind of uh, major open injuries associated with polytrauma, hemostatic resuscitation is very important, uh, which involves transfusion of packed red blood cells, FIP and platelets in the ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1. And in addition to that, we need to control the bleeding from the open wound by either by application of uh, uh, tight uh, bandage or we can apply even uh, tourniquet also for temporary tourniquet to control the bleeding and apart from these uh, two uh, external fixator application is also a part of damage control resuscitation which uh, minimizes the movement of the bone and uh, minimizes the bleeding from the medullary canal of the uh, bone and we need to look at uh, damage control resuscitation and adequacy of resuscitation is very important and uh, the serum lactate tells us whether we have resuscitated the patient properly uh, by looking at the serum lactate levels. It should be less than two millimoles per liter. Having seen what to do in casualty and then uh, how to resuscitate the patient, now uh, we need to go, we need to see when to do the debridement and uh, when to do and how to do the debridement. Here is a 37 year old gentleman presents in the middle of the night around 2 a.m. with a bilateral uh, open injury of the distal femur and the lactate levels are 6.5 millimoles per liter. And apart from bilateral distal femur fractures, uh, no other systemic injuries patient has and he is a 37 years old young patient. And when he presents like this, the only problem that we are seeing is the lactate is quite high and uh, instead of rushing through uh, inside the OT 
to do the debridement and external fixator. First, we need to resuscitate the patient properly by giving adequate fluids, both crystalloids and colloids. And if the patient presents uh, in the middle of the night, like 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., where the uh, staff personnel are quite less, we can post the patient in the morning 6.30 or 7 o'clock where uh, fresh personnel are available and full team is available so that we can do a good job uh, rather than doing in the middle of the night and uh, better not to rush for these kind of fractures. It is important to do the department as early as possible. However, uh, adequate resuscitation is also very important uh, before we go for the debridement. There is enough evidence now that uh, six hours rule of debridement is no longer valid. And more than the timing of debridement, it is the technique and adequacy of the debridement that is more important. And uh, we need to remember that no flap can compensate a poor debridement. This patient who had a bilateral distal femur fractures had a damage control procedures uh, next day morning after resuscitation, uh, external fixator was applied. And once the patient is fit for uh, next procedures, Bilateral distal femur plating was performed and it went on to heal completely without any problems and there were no infections and good outcome was achieved in this patient. The soft tissue injury determines the final outcome of the patient and uh, in these kind of injuries where the bone is projected out through the open wounds around the knee, we need to debride the soft tissue, uh, skin, muscle, uh, where uh, the contusion is quite high and then rupture of muscles also can be seen. The layer by layer debridement is very important and uh, around the knee uh, when the skin flaps are quite large better not to be too radical to exercise the skin flaps because they are quite uh, loosely mobile and also they have a good soft tissue uh, underlying soft tissue uh, attachment uh, which will survive when we close when we use them to cover the uh, open wound and this patient had a, a uh, adequate, adequate debridement and primary closure and primary uh, plating and uh, went on to have a complete union without any further requirement of the procedures. Having seen how to debride and when to debride, uh, how far we can uh, go for the skeletal fixation on day one? Let us see. This is a patient, uh, is a 41 years old gentleman who had uh, five centimeters of open wound around the knee the, uh, and he has associated chest injury with lung contusion and facial injuries and scalp hematoma also. And on day one, uh, we resuscitated the patient properly and then uh, open wound of five centimeters was extended both proximally and distally and the thorough arthrotomy uh, exposed the joint properly and then uh, excise all the devitalized tissue was performed. And then the, there were a lot of loosely lying cortical fragments in the metaphyseal region. Those fragments were also removed and then articular reconstruction was performed on day one. It, uh, on day one, it is very easy to reduce all the articular fragments. And sometimes by any reason, if the surgery gets postponed uh, for secondary procedures, uh, it is very easy to re reconstruct uh, bone defects or subsequent procedures. Articular reconstruction, if we don't do on day one, maybe it is very difficult later on to align very easily that we do on day one. This patient had a damage control procedure by external fixator application and arthrotomy, articular reconstruction. Now the job is very easy. Uh, once the patient is fit for next, next procedure, we have done uh, plate alignment and fixation. And we added, since there is a bone loss at the fracture site, we added uh, cancellous grafts and uh, alignment also was checked by cautery test, which shows good in alignment. And these are the follow-up x-rays shows fracture is uniting well. And in 15 months time, he has achieved complete uh, union and also near normal function of uh, near normal function and is able to do all his activities. So the answer for how far to go on day one is we need to follow two step strategy in major injuries and debridement adequacy of debridement is very important and joint can be reconstructed on day one and then external fixator can be applied and definitive fixation for the bone can be done once the patient is fit for next procedure. Mm -hmm. There are situations where we may not be able to debride adequately on day one, like this patient who had a cow dung contamination due to injury on the road. And uh, sometimes the, at the, even at the end of uh, the thorough debridement, if, our, uh, if we feel that 
there is still contaminants left over, we can come back again after 48 hours and then bring him back again, debris uh, one more time, have a second look of uh, the uh, joint completely. And then we can do a fixation like this. And this patient went on to heal uh, without any problems of infection or stiffening. When we see uh, large open injuries, we see combination of both uh, articular fragments as well as cortical fragments at the metaphyseal region. And when we open to do the debridement, many times the cortical uh, loosely lying fragments, they come into our hand. So which are all the fragments that we can retain and which are all the fragments we need to excise. And uh, here we can see that the articular fragments, most of them are outside. So these kind of comminuted fragments, if we discard them, it is very difficult to reconstruct the joint. So almost all it ends up in either arthrodesis or uh, yeah, almost all it, it will require like an arthrodesis procedure. Very difficult to replace an articular segment. So better not to excise the articular segment and uh, take time to debride thoroughly, take a scalpel and screw, uh, scrape the whole segment, uh, multiple fragments, remove all the dirt and as much as possible retain the articular fragment. Uh, however, the uh, cortical segments without any soft tissue attachment, they are going to be the nidus for uh, infection. So it is better that we excise the cortical segments, but not the articular segments. This patient had a reconstruction on table uh, and then uh, uh, he went on to have a good union and uh, we achieved complete articular uh, reconstruction on day one itself. There are situations where we see major open injuries around the knee uh, after, after feeling that uh, the debridement is adequate, we can actually look at uh, the wound size and then uh, uh, the flaps, which they come very closely each other and we can approximate them without any problems. And we can avoid soft tissue coverage, uh, soft tissue cover procedures secondarily by bringing them and close them primarily. Uh, the indications to do primary closure is uh, when the skin edges are easily approximatable without any much tension throughout the suture line and uh, the contamination is not much and uh, the uh, debridement is adequate and the fixation is uh, quite stable, then we can proceed for uh, primary closure on day one. And while debriding these kind of large flaps lying around uh, the knee, loosely lying around the knee, uh, we need to be very careful not to do radically uh, excise the skin margins because they are mostly attached to the underlying uh, tissues and they will be most of the times they will be viable. So we need to check, doubly check uh, before we excise the skin flaps. And uh, this patient who had a large flap, uh, which looks like a huge uh, defect, but uh, at the end of the stable skeletal fixation, we could actually close most of the wound which required uh, uh, no soft tissue cover and healed without any problems. Uh, in major open injuries, sometimes we can do a primary plate fixation also, uh, provided the debridement is quite adequate and then uh, the patient is quite stable without any systemic injuries. In those situations, we can go for primary plate fixation instead of going for a two-step strategy. Here, uh, the, it is a major open injury around the knee joint and no other systemic injuries. And we can see that the whole uh, open wound has been completely thoroughly debrided and the soft tissue rent was, uh, uh, through the soft tissue rent, the joint was opened, uh, complete thorough arthrotomy was performed. And this shows that the adequacy of the debridement is completely achieved. In these situations, when the general condition allows us, on day one, instead of fractional fixator, we can choose uh, plate fixation and this patient went on to have complete uh, union without any signs of infection and had a good range of movements as well. Whenever we see these kind of major injury, injuries, these are all barely salvageable limbs where uh, there is a problem of bone, there is a problem of soft tissue and uh, because of this major soft tissue crush, there can be systemic effects also which can cause, which can be uh, life threatening also. In these situations, there should be some guidelines as to whether to salvage or amputate these kind of limbs. And the Ganga Hospital Open Injury Severity Score helps us in these situations and guides us whether to amputate or salvage on day one and when to do soft tissue cover, bony reconstruction procedures. 
this patient the total score was uh, 16 which falls in the gray zone of the uh, gray zone of the, the total score and here up to uh, up to 14 the ganga hospital total open injury score we can salvage the limbs confidently and 17 and above it is advisable to do amputation and 15 and 16 which is a gray zone uh, where we can decide about the salvage and amputation based on multiple other factors as well, like skill of the team, experience, and patient factors and injury characteristics as well. This patient, uh, we chose to do uh, salvage, and we have an excellent uh, plastic surgery team as well, uh, which gets involved from day one, from the time we receive the patient. And uh, this patient, we had a adequate debridement and external fixator application on day one, and day four, uh, soft tissue cover was performed. And then subsequently, reconstructive procedures were performed for bone as well, which went on to heal very well without any problems. And we could achieve complete soft tissue healing. And uh, to our surprise, even though the patella was also completely uh, excised, extensor expansion was repaired at, on day one, which helped us to achieve uh, up to 90 degrees of knee flexion in this patient. So what made this possible, if you look at, uh, if you analyze retrospectively, it is the multidisciplinary approach of uh, involving orthopedic surgeon, uh, plastic surgeon and anesthesia team from day one and uh, adequate research station on arrival, damage control, choosing damage control procedures and following two-step strategies and uh, making, make sure that we are uh, adequately debriding the wounds and giving adequate uh, stability on day one itself, and then proceeding early cover and early wow. reconstructive procedures, which helps us to initiate early knee movements, can, uh, which uh, helps us to achieve good uh, outcome like this. The good outcome is possible in majority of the open injuries uh, when we follow this kind of this uh, uh, multiple multidisciplinary approach like this where a major open injury we can achieve after good outcome after multiple uh, reconstructive procedures and uh, we need to remember that now we are in the era of functional re restoration where uh, major majority of the open injuries uh, we have adequate principles and uh, reconstructive procedures and availability of microsurgery team with all this availability we can uh, achieve good outcome and uh, restore function as uh, to near normal as possible However, poor outcomes are also possible, which we need to remember because of the severe soft tissue crush and also bone loss and the combination, especially uh, when, the, when the distal femur fractures are associated with floating knee, like proximal tibia fractures. In spite of multiple attempts at uh, making the fracture un union, and uh, still we can, we can be left over with uh, problems like uh, persistent infection, non-union, stiff knee and persistent pain while walking. So we need to be very careful in choosing the uh, procedures and choosing the patient as well. Thank you. Thank you, Devendra. I'm sure that you can go on and on because you have been the entire team. We are managing a lot of open injuries and you have a special interest also. So I'm Thank sure you, that you, you keep on going on all these wounds and then talks, you can continuously speak for many hours. So it has been a good coverage of open injuries, especially on the supracondylar region. And uh, of all these, what is that you feel that in, in open supracondylar femurs, say if there is a fracture that comes in, and which is, suppose you said you can have a lot of work, soft tissue injury damage also and bone injury also, but still we can keep on uh, salvaging it also. But which, which is the single most criterion by which you decide that amputation is more preferable than salvage? When the bone loss... Uh... If we can make the bone heal well and also get adequate soft tissue cover, if these two factors are, uh, we, we, uh, if we think that we can achieve bo complete bone union by make by following reconstructive procedures, uh, we can think of salvaging those kind of limbs. 
and uh, if we think that on day one itself the soft tissue recovery is very difficult when there is associated uh, any vascular injuries or systemic injuries uh, where amputation is better to save the limb to save the life of the patient in those situations amputations are better otherwise orthoplastic approach uh, from day one itself uh, will help us to de uh, decide about salvage in majority of these injuries Farid, your comments, Farid. Um, actually, my comment would be, uh, I'm glad there's a direct flight from Singapore to Coimbatore. <laughs> and uh, in case you need this expertise, you can come directly for help or send the patient directly. Or if I need this, uh, I need to go directly there to get my treatment. So that's my first comment. I think uh, it's, it's a lot of excellent examples. Uh, your question about amputation is a, a very good question because it is one of the most difficult questions to answer. Um, um, patients, uh, there is a very good answer from uh, Devendra about um, life first. I wanted to ask about the autoplastic teams, you know, especially when there are multiple injuries on the limb and if you need uh, flap coverage on more than one area, uh, that may be a, a problem uh, when you have uh, multiple wounds and uh, you need multiple free flaps to cover those wounds. Uh, would that be one area where salvage is tough because the soft tissue uh, coverage is not possible? Yeah. Or, or, Devendra, or do you have some magic team who can handle all those things? All those things? No, sir. I think... Uh... If plastic surgeon and orthopedic surgeon both feels on day one that we can achieve bony union as well as adequate soft tissue cover, uh, then we can look at the salvage. First, the surgeon and uh, plastic surgeon and orthopedic surgeon should feel confident that we can make this fracture heal and also soft tissue cover. We can get the adequate soft tissue cover. Then we can look at the salvage of these limbs. However, uh, polytrauma situations, where uh, life is first, then limb. In those situations, if the bleeding is more or if the soft tissue injury is quite high, where patient may not sustain the crush of the uh, soft tissues, uh, causing systemic effects, in those situations, amputation is better. So, uh, from what I understand, the key is actually have two expert opinions to make that decision. Yes. It's not a decision to be made by one surgeon alone for your amputation. Is that... What I understand you to say? Yes, sir. Yes. Correct. Correct. Very important. So, so both plastic as well as ortho department, both of them decide whether to go ahead with amputation. So, together and uh, yeah. on site to make that decision. Yeah. I think that's excellent. Something uh, we need to aspire to try and uh, follow, but so difficult to have that. Uh, Excellent working together. So now we move on to case discussion so that in the end we have, we can have a small round of uh, case uh, discussions as well. So Mudit, Mudit uh, any, any questions on this now or? Sir, I have a question to uh, Dr. Vail, sir. Vail, sir? Yeah. Well, Murugesh. Uh, yeah. Sir, any tips to diagnose uh, whether the hoof of element is medial or lateral if one does not have access to uh, CT scan? So, can any tips to diagnose it uh, on the X-ray? We can see for the metaphyseal spike. Usually, it is visible mostly, especially in the oblique view. We can get to see the metaphyseal spike, which is uh, there, and we can also see where there is a uh, where where we are able to see a double shed on the articular surface. So, I'm talking about whether it can be diagnosed whether the fragment is lateral or medial over the X-ray. There is a metaphyseal spike. There, that's it. There is the there is the fracture. No, basically, oblique views will let you know whether it is medial or lateral. So, also the double shadow of the articular margin in the AP view, the double shadow of the articular margin also will tell us whether it is on the medial side or lateral side. Okay. Okay. So that is it. Then we move on to a case discussion. Uh, Ashok, Ashok or Supriya, whoever is there, uh, is there any time limit? 
Farid, how are you? Uh, no, I'm all right. Don't okay. worry. Okay. So we'll have only few few case discussions. So who is start? Zakaria can start now. So. So we are presenting the entire team for you, Farid. So all, 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 all of us are involved in only trauma practice. Wow. Nice to meet all of you. I, some of you I've met before. Yeah. Devendra, definitely yes, I've met sir. you before. Yes, sir. I uh, assisted you when you did a first PFNA2 in our hospital in 2010, I think. Oh, wow. Was it that long ago? Yeah, yes, okay. sir. Right. Okay. So... Um, uh, nice to meet all of you. Nice to meet all of you. Yes, Shall we see Thank the you. cases? Hello. Good evening, all. Sir, I'll be presenting the uh, uh, today's case discussion. So, this is a 55 year old male who was admitted in the casualty with the history of RTA, two wheeler breast two wheeler, sustained injury to the right thigh and the knee. He had an intact neurovascular deficit. So, these are the presenting x rays. He had a commutative distal femur fracture, which is in um, circumferential metaphyseal combination was seen. There was a focal uh, combination on the medial, asp medial aspect with the medial pophos. These are the CT pictures. So with the CT scan and then the X-ray, we are able to find out that there is a commutative uh, distal, uh, distal femur fracture. There you see an extensive metaphyseal combination with the medial pophos. These fractures are low-lying fractures. And the age is 60 years and there are a lot of osteoporosis element also in it. So, so did, how... Uh, Zagari, did the patient also have a pre-existing knee pain? So the patient had initially, he had a childhood, uh, childhood injury and he is telling that he is not able to walk for less than uh, more than two kilometers. Hmm. So there is pre-existing ONE also is this. So Farid, your comments on this? So how to proceed, sir? Well, um, though he has a pre-existing ONE, and uh, we can see um, uh, even the the tibial articular surface shows some uh, some uh, arthritic changes. So definitely that is there. The fracture is very low down, it's very comminuted, but uh, the patient is relatively young. Uh, in terms of the cortex or the shaft is good, but um, how much osteoporosis he has is an issue. Now he can't walk very much, so, um, uh, but given his age uh, uh, and uh, that uh, his issue, there are two choices here. Um, because his function was already poor to start with and he has some pre-existing arthritis and he can't walk and it is because of this knee that is uh, uh, prosthetic replacement. But he's too young, it's too expensive, but it's something to think about. Uh, because uh, prosthetic replacement of this magnitude for such a young patient uh, would fail him uh, eventually. So this would be a reconstruction with uh, plating I'm not going to nail this, huh? by the way, uh, Dr. Ramesh, okay. sorry. Uh, don't think I can. No, it's too low to nail it anyway. So yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, so definitely uh, reconstruction of the articular surface. You will need headless screws to fix some of the articular fragments as well as the uh, Hoffa's fragments. And you will run out of space very quickly to fix the articular block uh, to the shaft. Uh, we don't, well, you don't need a very long plate in this situation, I think. Um, you definitely need to have an open approach because you will need to address the medial hoffers. You will need to see the articular reduction and put in headless screws. Uh, the only question to me is uh, after the lateral plating, do I want to put a supplementary plate on the medial side if I don't have sufficient uh, fixation on the lateral side distally? More the distal fractures, uh, it is very short segment. It is always, uh, I feel it's uh, always preferable to use bicondylar plate, both sides. You know. So it is very low. So I think 
Yes, very, very good. Yeah. So I think both sides plate would be better. Yeah. How so about the others? Mudit, Mudit, what's your idea? Because Mudit oh. is uh, yes. uh, uh, not from Ganga Hospital, so we can pull him and then ask him for some discussions. So. Uh, sir, uh, preferably I would like to go for a medial parapetal approach. And obviously, bicolumnar plating would be the uh, option of my choice. My choice. Ramesh, what's your take? So, I'm also not for uh, nail in this case. It is a uh, low transcondylar fracture involving both the condyles. My take will also be the plating on both the sides. Uh, so probably it is of uh, uh, more comminution on the medial side. Probably I'll do a bicolumnar plating on both the sides using a headless screws also. Okay. Yeah, as many of the <laughs> panelists agree with then bicolumnar plate. Since I the... have one more question, Jakaria. Yes, sir. No, the, obviously there is no role of uh, nail in this and uh, only locking plate will uh, help, plating will help us to achieve good reduction in this. So, whether to choose two, uh, two separate incisions on either side so that we can access the posterior margin on both sides and make sure that we are reducing the fractures very well because they are lying very low. And if you take single incision, uh, sometimes the soft tissue dissection that you do on both sides will be very high. Instead of uh, taking a single incision, whether we can choose two separate incisions. So uh, exactly these fractures, uh, this fracture uh, particularly we took a uh, double incision. Since the medial condyle fracture, uh, uh, fracture and the the hofas were more posterior, so this wouldn't uh, this would be very impossible to achieve in a single incision. So it is whenever there is an hofas with the low lying fracture, low condylar fractures, it is always advisable to have it uh, bilateral. That is both lateral as well as the medial incision. Exactly the same thing was done. Uh, so first we did a lateral plating, we were able to reconstruct the lateral condyle, then we opened on the medial side, we were able to reduce the hofa fragment, then we put uh, screws over there. Mm. But uh, usually we used to do an, uh, uh, we used to do a uh, buttress plate, since there is an element of uh, 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 osteoporosis, the buttress plate was not holding. So we need to supplement with an uh, locking plate. So with this locking plate, we are able to have hold it, uh, at least three screws were able to get it in the uh, medial condyle as well as in the Hofa fracture, which is been reduced with an headless screws. So this is the first post op. Dr. Fari, they need your comments. So you said you use a dual incision. Yes, sir. So uh, lateral parapatella incision and then uh, Posterior medial incision? What, what do you mean by a dual incision? Subbusters, yeah. Okay. So, um, yes, sir. Uh, fairly, uh, I think you have uh, in this situation, if we look, uh, when I look at a post op x ray, I uh, first look at the alignment of the bone. And uh, when I look at the lateral, I think you've got the condyles uh, uh, rotation well done. Uh, they look uh, aligned with the posterior cortex and it's the posterior cortex that helps you get that alignment because that's the more reliable part uh, and probably less comminution in the posterior cortex. Um, in terms of the coronal alignment, uh, maybe a little bit on the various side, okay? Could be a bit more valgus, but uh, still very good for such a comminution. Uh, I think the articular surface, you've done a good job from what I can see. Uh, and that's well reduced, but the patient already has a pre-existing uh, arthritis. So you've done a very good job there. With regards to your plate fixation, um, I think you... You have adequate distal fixation and uh, your lateral plate definitely has, uh, you know, it's quite a long plate, definitely, right? You've got uh, both uh, plates, one longer than the other. 
your medial plate, uh, distal fixation. Uh, very good. You, you, your, all your fixation has not gone into the notch and you have that additional medial fixation for the medial combination. So I think on the whole, it's an excellent job. It's a very tough fracture to deal with. Um, it's very low, extremely comminuted. Um, um, other than that, it's very good. Do you routinely use these kind of, what kind of plate do you choose on middle side, sir, Dr. Farid? Okay. Do you, so, do you contour the plate to come ex, uh, up to the middle most, distal most margin or uh, this kind of fixation where uh, we stop the plate quite higher above and then get a purchase from superior to inferior, this kind so, of configuration is okay. So the two things I, I would consider for my medial plate is what I need to fix on the medial side. If I need to use it just because of the medial metaphysical combination, then... Uh, I think any standard plate that can get me two screws distally and uh, at least two screws proximally with a little bit of contouring is what I require because all I need to do is fix uh, the shaft to the block. However, if the medial side is comminuted and I need to fix additional fragments on the medial side, then I've been using um, a proximal lateral Tibur plateau plate. Okay. That goes quite distal, as you said, and has got a flange that goes down. So posteriorly. Does, so does that uh, make body. sense? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. To fix additional fragments on the medial side. Yeah. We routinely use uh, DCP plate, which we contour it like a curved, uh, uh, which comes up to the middle most tip. Uh, distal most margin on the medial side and then we get horizontal screws that is also yes. one configuration we see. i see so you go uh, right distally to the um, um, you are engulfing the entire medial condyle so that you get into a good fixation so. right 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 for me i, I don't go beyond uh, what this plate would show if there's a big medial block that i just need to put two screws that would be my my most common fixation. But when there's additional combination, then my plate would be, uh, you're right, more distally uh, with uh, using that uh, uh, lateral proximal table plate. Yeah. More the short segment frag fragment, I think we have to go further down. Otherwise, this That's is right. also sufficient. Yeah. Regarding the approach, uh, Dr. Farid, do you use uh, two incisions or single incision for this kind of uh, configuration? Um, so I would use a single midline incision uh, to see my reduction. And I would, uh, in this case, since you uh, did have, uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, take the sub approach for the medial side. And uh, therefore it would be a medial parapetella approach. But for the lateral side, then uh, once my articular block is there and reduced, uh, I can, uh, you know, it's not, easy to fit the lateral plate in, you can make just a small lateral incision and put the plate up. Okay. Does that, uh, can you understand yeah. that? What I'm yeah, trying yeah. to say? And, yeah. So what is your take on primary bone grafting, sir? Okay. Um, I'm not in favor of primary bone grafting uh, unless there are uh, 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 segments that you need to support with the bone graft. In the metaphysical area, uh, in the distal femur, not a fan. I, I don't primary bone graft. So uh, when, we, when we were done with this case, there was a, a small void about less than two centimeters. So if it is less than two centimeters, we're in bone graft. If suppose the combination would be more than two centimeters, we'd have primarily a bone graft. You meant the bone loss. Bone loss and the medial aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yes, there would be an uh, impaction of the bone. Impaction of the bone. But for a close fracture, well, I, I, in the metaphysical area, I think it can heal quite fast, quite well. Not a fan. I guess uh, a fibular strut is an option, right? I've seen uh, 
Didi, yeah. you would like to use it? Fibular strut in non-union scenarios we have used. Primary scenarios, not, not, that, not that we have used here. Yeah. Only okay. non-union scenario we have used. Right. We have used fibula in the open fracture scenario where we get a bone gap and then we need to fix it with the plate. We have used fibula as a medial strut. So the, it says a strut, so it gives yeah. support. Yes, not it, is not, it is not in addition to a medial plate. Either yeah. we use a medial plate or a medial strut grafting. So. I see. Okay. Uh, this patient, uh, uh, we started on early, what are the, why we chose to uh, dual plating is the metaphyseal combination, low, uh, low transcondylar fractures, the medial hofas, the small medial condyle fracture and the medial void. So these are the four or five points which made us to do a, a medial plating. Also. Uh, Dr. Faisal, do you agree with this or anything else we have to include in this? No, I agree with it. The medial void and uh, very important uh, issue and uh, the very low transcondylar fracture, these are the two important things for you to consider. So I agree with this completely. Okay, move on to our next. So this is the six weeks post-op X-ray. The fracture went on to unit 12. And we had an uh, weight bearing mobilization at the end of six weeks. This is three months and six months post-operative X-ray. And this is a nine months, just complete union of the fracture. And he had a reasonable range of uh, knee movements. Probably back to his original knee movement. Yeah, original knee movement. Very nice. So thank you, sir. Arun? Jagar, you have one more? Oh, sir, Dr. Arun Kamal. Uh, Arun, yeah. Uh, good, good evening, all. Uh, is my screen visible, sir? Not yet. Uh, yeah. Yes. Now it's okay. Yes, sir. Now screen uh, is not seen. You are seen. Screen. You have to seen. share. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sir. Sorry. Sir. Visible now, sir. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. This is uh, good evening, all, sir. It was an excellent uh, discussion, and uh, I'm here to present uh, an interesting case. It is a uh, 47 years male uh, who had a road traffic accident. He had a two wheeler collided with a car. He presented with a comminuted uh, distal femur fracture with a, a metaphyseal comminution, and there is an open wound, as you can see, a two by two centimeters open wound was there. Uh, it was sutured outside, and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, when you see these kind of injuries, what are the things uh, which runs through your mind? Uh, is one is this: it's a very high velocity injury. And second thing, it is uh, uh, the patient uh, resuscitation is of uh, utmost important. Utmost important. You have to do an ATLS protocol. Uh, you have to resuscitate the patient adequately, and also you have to look for other associated injuries. Like uh, there can be associated chest injury or uh, an abdomen blunt injury, abdomen. You have to look for this. So whenever you are getting a, such a high velocity injury, uh, I would like to uh, go a little slow and then uh, do a thorough ATLS protocol and then you resuscitate the patient well. So uh, after seeing this X-ray, can uh, any one of you can suggest like what should be the next uh, next step? How how should we proceed this case? Um, can I ask opinion from Jakaria if you are well? This. Sakaria, you want to answer? Well, uh, after seeing this X-ray, what will be your thought process? So, uh, since it's in uh, commutated distal femur fracture, uh, commutated distal, open distal femur fracture, then the X-ray also shows that a lot of uh, contamination over there. The yes, yes. Is, uh, we need to do a thorough debridement. Yeah. And intraoperatively, we need to assess uh, whether the patient is uh, stable enough to do for a a primary plating or suppose if the patient is not fixed we just do need to do a thorough debridement articular reconstruction and we need to stage the procedure sir yeah yeah we can do an x fix exactly exactly 
uh, so as you rightly pointed out there is uh, you can see lot of uh, some foreign particles in the x ray uh, multiple foreign particles there is also very uh, significant amount of swelling and soft tissue disruption so these Arun, patients Arun, it will also be the similar like uh, what devendra has explained in his talk about the suction effect no see like there is yes, a small sir. wound yes, bone sir. just bone comes out and takes the mud particles inside along with the uh, bone segment yes, so i think uh, debridement would be the key in this so i think we'll have to look in and uh, how often uh, this happens see like the bone comes out and then goes back in how much of soft tissue disruption would have happened in this so because we we see only a small wound no uh, naturally the the mechanism has been described in one of the slides by dr devendra so there is a momentary uh, decelerative force so the shaft will try to uh, penetrate through the cordyceps tendon and it will just because a negative suction effect it tries to absorb whatever the contamination around and uh, as the uh, Uh, as we try to ship the patient to hospital somebody will pull the limb and uh, the fracture will again goes back in say so uh, through for the wound may be looking may look very small but actually uh, the amount of violence and the contamination will be little large so always better to uh, debride this wound thoroughly and then to proceed so uh, Arun, that's i have one point can you go back to the previous slide Yes. See, uh, one more, uh, as Didi sir told, uh, to identify whether the suction effect is there or not, we can. Uh, one more thing is, we can see that there are some contaminants seen at the tip of the uh, proximal fragment. Yes. The, uh, white, white, uh, whitish uh, spots, and also we need to look at the soft tissue. Sorry, uh, gas shadow around the femur, the proximal fragment, up to where, uh, when if there is a soft tissue stripping. where the frag fragment has come out uh, and then gone back the, due to gas shadow we can identify up to where the soft tissue stripping is there yes. so you can see that the proximally also on the lateral side the gas shadow is extending up to the proximal mid third yeah. region yeah so in this situation we have to do proper arthrotomy uh, give preference to the removal of all the dirt medullar canal has to be the bony debridement is very important the here because when there is contaminants over the tip of the bone we should not excise too much of bone also we need to use a scalpel and then scrape it con continuously we have to scrape uh, till you achieve complete adequate debridement of the bony tip and also the medullar canal also gets sucked in i mean the, with the foreign material so we need to use uh, curate and then uh, curate the medullary canal as long as uh, as uh, proximal as possible and then we can use a suction tip and, and then put the suction tip inside so that that also will suck out all the uh, materials that is there inside the medullary canal and yes. even while washing also when you wash the medullary canal we use the suction tip and uh, so that it goes quite deeper inside and then sucks out all the material so deeper bony debridement is possible only on day one and uh, once you stabilize it with plate then no way that you are going to remove the plate and again debride even if there is an infection so the opportunity to debride uh, the bone is only on day one so that we need to uh, remember and the negative suction effect causes passage of uh, contaminants even onto the other side of the bone we see when we do arthrotomy and then extend the wound we will be on mostly on the lateral side we, always we need to remember the contaminants will be on mostly on the medial side medial side and then higher up so always check lift the bone by a bone hook or uh, a uh, reduction clamp and then check the contaminants uh, because once we stabilize uh, next time when we go for a debridement we may not open again onto the medial side as well so medial side and then medullary canal these two things are very very uh, crucial uh, regions to debride on day one yes sir exactly uh, as he has rightly pointed out you can see the gas shadows uh, uh, extending up to the proximal uh, third of the uh, distal femur proximal third of the shaft so this is a very high velocity injury so definitely debridement on day one is a key and uh, we have to always cure the intramedullary canal as well so uh, this was the same thing which we did it on day one we did a damage control orthopedics the wound was uh, extended proximally and distally the articular arthrotomy was done the joint was debrided and uh, the open injury score was a uh, total of 
So why we chose an external fixator is one is this patient had a hypotension on arrival, and uh, there are many subtle advantages of doing an external fixation. Like one is it restricts the macro motion, so it helps to stabilize the clot. Second thing, it uh, enhances the venous return and the lymphatic flow. And uh, when you want to do a subsequent wound dressing uh, in the post-operative period, it gives adequate pain relief for the patient. So that's why uh, in these kind of cases, we need to go a little slow. So as we already, uh, we have discussed in the previous talks, like uh, any open injury comes, uh, we have to uh, follow this rule. Like you have to span, then you have to scan, and then you have to plan. So how does the CT helps you is, CT helps you to identify the intraarticular loose bodies. It helps you to identify any HOFAS element and also it helps you to plan your uh, preoperatively. So what, whether you need a dual plate or you need a single plate or uh, the type of implant. So this patient was taken up for a, a deep, uh, after the four days uh, prior to the first surgery, the patient was taken up for a second secondary procedure where there is, a no, there is no any active infection was there. So we did a open reduction and then we did a articular reconstruction. And then uh, as he has already described as a table test was used to know the fracture reduction. And then we did a, a lateral locking plate. And uh, uh, here I would like to emphasize few points. So one is that uh, always articular reconstruction should be your utmost uh, priority. And second thing, always look for the medial side continuity. So that is where the mechanical axis of the bone uh, transmits. So always look for the medial side continuity. And uh, most important is on the lateral view, the plate should be uh, positioned parallel to the posterior border of the plate and the posterior uh, condyle should be both positioned parallel. So that will take care of the flexion of the uh, distal fragment. So when you take care of all these things, uh, generally the healing shouldn't be a problem. And one more point uh, I would like to highlight here is this uh, patient is a manual laborer. He is a 47 years male. So uh, basically he, he, our reduction should be very stable. So what we chose is we, uh, in order to get a good bony contact, we uh, shortened, uh, we tried to dock the fracture site and then we achieved a good bony contact. And then uh, this fracture at uh, three months uh, had uh, showed a good uh, callus formation. And we started him on uh, weight bearing from the third month. And this is the final follow-up at 18 months. It uh, fracture healed uneventfully. And uh, we didn't uh, need to do any secondary procedure like bone grafting. So it was a, a solid union achieved and a reasonably good range of movements. He achieved up to 110 degrees of flexion and he was able to go back to normal. So generally this shortening of 1.5 centimeters won't be a problem, uh, especially when it's a uh, low demanding or a, or a manual laborer. So the will be compensated with the pelvic tilt. So here the uh, uh, take home points are that, uh, so any high velocity injuries, you have to be a little slow. You have to concentrate on your debridement part and you have to span the uh, limb with an external fixator. After you are making sure there is no infection, you can stabilize with a uh, locking plate. And then you have to restore the medial cortex continuity. You have to maintain your length, rotation, and axis. Start early in early range of knee movements. And then uh, you have to allow weight bearing only after the comminution uh, started, the uh, fracture starts to heal after the callus formation. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, can I just uh, ask a question to, I think, Dr. Devendra, I'd like to ask. Is yes, sir. the. Yes, sir incisions made for the debridement yes sir you know because uh, the wound comes out somewhere and it's quite unpredictable in this case probably anteriorly more common but it can come out medially laterally uh, and when you want to extend the incision to do your arthrotomy uh, yes. what sort of incision would you do because that will also uh, tell you what you're going to do at your next stage right or yes uh, sir you know so could you give us your you know uh, your, your tips, tricks, your pearls about the extension of the incision and how would, would you do separate incisions for the arthrotomy? Would you extend the primary wound? Uh, I know it's tough because the, the primary wound can be anywhere, but what would be your principles be? Yes, sir. Uh, if the wounds are, uh, if the wound is located in the anterior portion or lateral portion, uh, we can extend the incision. Uh, we can involve, we incorporate uh, this uh, existing open wound with the future plan of uh, doing a plating like we can extend proximally and distally so that we can do a, a total arthrotomy if the wound is on to the very medial side uh, we debride the wound by extending proximally and distally and then we choose a separate incision uh, for secondary plating purpose if it is located in the anterior portion or lateral portion, definitely uh, it will be incorporated in the uh, 
next procedure plan itself so your wound extension would incorporate your future uh, plan uh, future uh, plating uh, approach to the knee so that you can do arthrotomy and do your future plating whenever possible yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With some uh, adjustments for the open wound, correct? Yeah. And if there's a medial wound, you make a separate lateral wound for your uh, anterior lateral wound for your arthrotomy and washout, so that you can come back to reconstruct. Yes, yes. sir. Yes. Okay. So that will be your workhorse uh, uh, plan. I think that's very important because uh, many people would, you know, how do you extend the wound? How is that wound going to affect your next uh, plating and fixation? It's an important thing. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, can I proceed to the second case, sir? Mm, yes, please. Uh, sir, uh, this is another interesting case. Uh, it is a 46-year-old gentleman who had a road traffic accident. It was uh, traveling in a car. It has hit against a lorry. Uh, so, here it is... Uh, uh, can You can read from this X-ray. It is uh, involving a ipsilateral neck fracture with a comminuted distal femur fracture and inferior pole petla fracture. So when you get this kind of combination of injuries, uh, but uh, the good thing is that it's a closed fracture. So uh, can I ask the panelists, like, uh, what will be your thought process? How will you proceed with this case? What will be your choice of implant? Uh, Professor Farid, sir, can you give your comments, sir? Um, I would prefer um, two separate implants to to treat this rather than one implant. And um, um, I would like to fix the uh, proximal femur, uh, the femoral neck with a separate implant, which would be, for example, uh, DHS, and then uh, treat the uh, this fracture, which is, um, I think the patella is fractured too. Yeah, yes, it's a small inferior pole fat patella fracture, sir. Okay, yes, sir. and then uh, is it extra articular? It looks like. Yeah, it looks like extra articular, yes, sir. Ah, uh, so a retrograde nail that overlaps with the proximal implant. So you are uh, for I femur do, uh, neck. Uh, uh, at the same time, yes. Sorry. For, for femur neck, you will be doing DHS, sir. Uh, yeah, if you can give me some more views, I can <laughs> oh, give you better. Uh, but from this view, uh, okay, sir. Uh, uh, actually, it was uh, a fairly vertical yeah. fracture. Yes, yeah, so okay. more of vertical fractures. Yes, yeah, so a high powers grade. So yes. Um, well, DHS is the traditional implant. Of course, uh, we do have the. Uh, newer implants, but we discuss that separately. Yes, sir. Let's keep to the DHS. Of course, all my younger surgeons will not use the DHS anymore, and they use the new FNS, you know, so that's different. We discuss that separately. But if, this, uh, if you take this fracture neck with shaft, generally we see that the shaft is always comminuted, and then the neck is nearly fairly an undisplaced type of fracture you get because we always feel it is a secondary fracture and femur is the primary fracture. So, yes. so in those instances, uh, you immediately said you will use two implants. Suppose if yes. this fracture were to be a little higher, say let us take it as a shaft and then you would you have done with single implant or still a double implant? I mean, that's always a continuous thing, but I would prefer a double implant. That is still my uh, uh, preferred option. Mm. Uh, so a retrograde nail for the shaft, uh, fixation with screws or FNS or DHS for the neck, and um, what do you call this? Uh, uh, address it that way. In this situation, because of the patella fracture, I think is ideal. Uh, you can address it too if you need to. Um, and if often when you have um, uh, uh, kind of, this is very far segmental, but segmental fractures, there's a higher risk of complication of one of the two fractures. And having separate implants may help you be able to deal with it without uh, having to remove the whole implant. 
Yeah. So that's my yeah. my my philosophy. Yeah. And sir, you're... Roof, roof. Yes, sir. You are very correct, sir. So ideally, this case needs a dual implant. So I have listed out some of the treatment options for this case. Uh, of course, the single implant is ruled out. Second thing is uh, a cephalomillary nail or a distal femur locking plate is uh, another option. Uh, DHS and retrograde nail, which was your choice, and uh, DHS and uh, distal femur locking plate. Another thing, uh, you are uh, you are getting a good reduction. You can also be, uh, you can also try the cancellous screw and uh, locking plate and uh, LCP as well. So actually, this case uh, uh, intraoperatively we uh, found out that uh, the lesser trochanter was in the middle segment was externally rotated. So that means it is you have to derotate the external rotator. So we put position the patient on a fracture table. Uh, we used a shaft spin uh, to derotate the shaft fragment, and then we uh, were able to get a reasonably good alignment to the neck fracture. So we did a, a, a cancellous crucifixion to a small incision, and then for the shaft uh, for the distal femur we again uh, redraped and we position on a conventional table. So we uh, placed a bolster under the underneath the uh, uh, distal femur, and then we did a locking plate fixation. And the same, uh, uh, it was actually a midline incision, but it was slightly uh, uh, curved uh, laterally. So we were able to address a petal also through the same incision, and then we did a locking plate. A uh, few important points I would like to highlight is always uh, maintain the length of the combination, and then you make sure your uh, length rotation axis are. Uh, equal is uh, maintained and uh, you have to choose the implant so the uh, many companies have different uh, types of plates so you have to choose, make sure that the locking screw uh, central hole comes parallel to the articular margin and uh, always restore the medial border alignment so medial border continuity should be restored and uh, this patient had a uh, four months uh, uh, follow uh, there was slightly you can see that the mild angulation in the fracture site in the four months but uh, that was uh, relatively not uh, very uh, stable and the patient also, uh, we allowed him to do gradual weight bearing and uh, subsequently at eight months, uh, this fracture went on to heal. But, I, I, but ultimately the fracture healed with a little bit of virus, with five degree of virus. But uh, uh, overall the outcome was good. Even the neck fracture healed uneventfully. This is at uh, 18 months follow-up and uh, the re uh, reasonably very good uh, hip and uh, knee range of movements. So I, I'm sure Dr. Ramesh would have wanted to nail this. Yeah, nailing is a good option because exactly. is, that would have prevented the virus also. And also, like the how do you decide whether to use a cancellous screw or a DHS plate? Say the in these type of situations. See, like Farid said, he can he will use a DHS screw. But you have used the cancellous. Is there any variations that the decisions that can be changed based on anything? Or um, basically, uh, if you compare the two implants, uh, DHS has a slightly better advantage because it is a fixed angle device, and uh, the fracture is also more vertical. But here we chose because uh, we could be able to get a good anatomical reduction uh, with the minimal incision. So it was only a, a three centimeters incision, uh, not a, uh, so DHS requires a longer incision and uh, sometimes we have to, uh, there will be a stress riser between the two two implants. So, uh, so it the, is, the, that is why Farid mentioned that he'll overlap the implants. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, yeah, so. So, like, uh, I think uh, it is the bone quality also matters. Suppose see the cancellous screw will work well when the bone quality is very good. So. Mm -hmm. In osteoporosis or slightly elderly patients, cancellous screws will not work as like a DHS screw. So that is why you are, yeah, that is one of the important parameters you must consider whenever you are doing a cancellous screws. If the yes, bone sir. quality is good, you need not hesitate to do a cancellous screw fixation. Suppose yes, if, if the quality, if you are worried, then you must go in for a DHS with side plates. That is the DHS screws. Yeah. Yes. What, what's your take for it? So uh, I think uh, with the high Powell's angle, um, and you're right about the osteoporosis. Uh, osteoporosis has a slightly, so you need a, a more a rigid device like the DHS. And of course uh, we can talk about other implants, but uh, high Powell's angle, more osteoporotic patient, a DHS and uh, would be what I would prefer and uh, rather than the screws. And if I was forced to use screws for some reason, 
the for the high powers angles, my screws may be aligned a little bit differently. So uh, one screw perpendicular to the fracture line, and then the other screws parallel to the neck or something of that sort, a uh, slightly different configuration uh, in a high powers angle. Otherwise, uh, for most uh, uh, medium or low power angle uh, 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 fractures of the neck, I think screws are very good and uh, good enough. Um, and of course, if the fracture was more distal at the intertrochantric region, then I will still use the DHS in this situation. And then I overlap. So there's always a way to overlap, but in this case, you're using plates and screws. So uh, it's quite good. You don't have that stress riser. So you must plan both fixations. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that you uh, did the neck first because that is the more important thing here to address first. But it's always difficult to address when the rest of the limb is detached, right? With the fracture, so you use a shunt spin or X fix or something to reduce it, uh, uh, reduce it and fix it. So I think that's a good order in which to do it. I would try to stabilize the neck before I address the rest of the femur. And so the, 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 the sequence in which you do it also is good. I'm sure Dr. Ramesh would want to nail this and he's an expert nailer. So would he use a one uh, anti-grade nail to address this? Dr. Ramesh, can I ask him this question? Yes, sir. Yes. Ah, you are uh, a nailer. Yeah, I would like to nail this one. Uh, anti-grade nail? Uh, no, retrograde nail. DHS for the neck and I'll overlap the distal femoral nail. I'll overlap both the implants to avoid stress tracer. But I do use an, uh, a base cervical or intertrochanic fracture with the shaft. I try to do an anti-grade nail addressing both the fractures with a single implant. So neck with this uh, femur, uh, neck, I will take a DHS. Farid, uh, you can also do an anti-grade nail. And also if uh, at the end of the procedure, if you feel that uh, there is something more to do, you can still add a plate distally. Yes, of course. Yeah. The I, I'm, I'm glad you say that because adding the plate distally sometimes is a salvage. Yeah. So. You find that you're, you know, when you do an integrate nail uh, that is recon, you may not get the length of the nail. Uh, uh, the, the recon nails determine where the nail goes. It may stick out proximally or, and then the length that you measure may not be as far down as you want. So you salvage with the distal plate. Excellent. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I had one uh, incidence where uh, the nail measurement came up to 480. Wow. So I have the, we have the in AFN, we have the maximum 440. Wow, so it, 480. Uh, wow. It was an athlete. So wow. we were able to get a good fixation as per uh, DDC instruction. Uh, we added a distal femur plate and overlapped the nail in a different way. So the distal plate was overlapping the nail. So patient had an uneventful outcome. Arun, can we see the final x-ray of that? So, Arun, you said uh, you used a shant spin to derotate the uh, femur and then get the reduction for the neck. Yes, sir. So could you have used the shant spin a little lower so that that pin hole would have been incorporated into the plate itself? Yeah, yes, sir. It is uh, uh, in the retrospective when we analyze that is a good option, sir. We could have uh, used it in the within the plate segment itself. Sir. Sometimes, if the screw hole is just at the end of your plate, that itself will be a stress riser zone, and then it can break also. So we we'll have to be. So whenever you we use that, probably you have to incorporate that into. Yes, sir. Uh, so actually, uh, this uh, algorithm was published in uh, this uh, archives of orthopedic and trauma surgery from a Ganga hospital. So here, basically, uh, we have discussed about the treatment options uh, to be considered when you're dealing with the recalcitrant distal femur non-unions. So basically, four uh, uh, pro problems should be addressed. Uh, like uh, you should uh, address the femoral bone stock, the extent of medial void, the alignment of fracture, and the stability of fixation. So when the medial void is uh, uh, very minimal, so you can just uh, go get away with the bone grafting. It is, uh, I would say, up to two centimeters, you have to think of an allograft and then uh, bone graft it. If it's more than two centimeters, you have to think of an additional medial plate. So the, this was the uh, algorithm we got out of this paper. 
So this is a case example where the the, the fracture had a, a varus angulation. It is a medial void. It went for non-union and then it is restricted to the fibula stud graft. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Arun. It was a very good case to bring in. So, so Zakaria, you have one more or? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Farid, so you said uh, in these uh, choices of fixation that we always discuss about uh, distal femur. So, which is the most uh, difficult fracture you thought is uh, seen in uh, distal femur? What type of fracture you will always be worried? Um, I think uh, for uh, really the, what I would be worried about would be really the open fractures. Um, I think close fractures, we have time, we can plan, we can uh, salvage, uh, whether it's the Hoffers or, or very low or osteoporotic. Uh, we can replace. But the open fractures um, is the most difficult job. And uh, getting uh, infection is my biggest worry, of course. I think non-union is easy to deal with. Uh, even uh, deformity can be corrected if there's various collapse. But the infection is the toughest thing to manage in the open fracture. And uh, uh, to me, that is the most difficult aspect in, uh, in terms of the infection. Soft tissue also, I think we've got good uh, autoplastics and uh, in our situation also uh, to manage that, but the infection is really tough to do. Uh, that requires a lot of reconstruction and you have with uh, severe infection, removal of additional bone, a very small distal femoral segment left, to uh, treat the infection and restore the bone, either by bone grafting, bone transport, uh, it's tough. That, that yeah. is my worry. Yeah. Or uh, Dr. Raj Sabhavati will always say, if you can able to do this case without getting infection or without providing a non-union, you go ahead. That's what he will always say. <laughs> so. Very good. So I think we have covered extensively the distal femur. And uh, there are a lot more cases to discuss, but I think there is no end to it if we bring in all the cases. But the only basic principles today. Next to distal femur part two, we are coming out with infection and non-union. So that will be an interesting discussion as well. So when we have a fresh fracture like this, so when, when you get a distal femur, I think all the principles laid out today are fantastic principles that need to be followed. And if followed, and then right implant is used in all these fractures, I'm sure that we can win over getting a good union in all these distal femur fractures. Sorry, we will have your comments as well, and then we will wind it up. Okay. Um, I think uh, what you said is very good. And... Um... Uh, the principles in terms of, uh, you know, you've, you had a choice of nailing, you had a choice of plating, uh, you've seen the steps that need to be done for the open fractures, you know that you have to look out for the hoffers and for the hoffers, you need to really, uh, I think there was an excellent presentation and you really have to think very carefully, even the approach you want to use and how you're going to access it. So I think these are factors that are very important and for the general orthopedic surgeon who does trauma, I think, um, you know, this is a good opportunity. Now this uh, pandemic has given us opportunity. I'm sorry, I'm deviating from the distal femur fracture in terms of this uh, teleconferencing and telecollaboration. I think Ganga Hospital should start a, a telecollaboration service with surgeons so that they can get your advice on how to manage these complex fractures when they can't you know, access you physically and they need to manage, but they need some uh, advice, opinions as to from your expert opinions. You can start a tele uh, consultation service, surgeon to surgeon. Uh, you know what I mean? So that you yeah. can help all the surgeons uh, who need your help at least remotely. And I think um, you know, having this conference, discussing all these issues, letting them know is good, but uh, and in Ganga Hospital, we know you are an 
for all of you here, you are focusing on the fractures. You will follow the principles. But for the average surgeon that needs your guidance, I think this is a good way to go. And it's a service that you can provide. Sorry, some idea that came to my mind. Yeah, Dr. Venkat does just message me that it is called surgical coach. So to remain like a surgical coach. Yes, the surgical so, coach can be a pre-op, can yeah. even be intraoperative. Yeah. They have some devices that you can even uh, give feedback and point to different parts of the x-ray, what to do. And you can have this service and grow your spectra service remotely. This is the Thanks. ideal opportunity. Everybody will be open to it. Thank you. Actually, we, we uh, all our friends send, our, send their cases through WhatsApp and then we keep discussing and then we even interrupt when something goes wrong, they immediately call and inform us. So I think we are doing it, but we are not doing it as a, a structured thing. So we, we can do that. Yes, we can definitely do it. Thank you. Thank you for your advice. Mudit, you are the only person who is also non-Ganga team here. So I think you, you can, we can take your uh, no. suggestion also and then go on. So. Uh, regarding the webinar? Yeah, regarding the webinar and then next. Yes, I mean, I'm very thankful to all the faculties for uh, providing and giving such a uh, dictated lectures. And it was really good to have you all. And I mean, all the cases that you have shown, you're doing an extensive job. It's really great. Okay, thank you, Mudit. Thank you. So actually, sure. the, our the Ramesh Perumal is a pelvic and acetabular surgeon who does other trauma as well. And then Devendra is more concentrating into orthogeriatrics and also he has got special interest in open injuries. Vail Murugesan is into upper limbs and then he does all the trauma as well. Sakarya is into lower extremity and the other, all other trauma. Because we all take calls except me of all other people take. And then, so they all do all the trauma, but they have a special interest. So Arun Kamal is more into ankle and foot. So each one of us have got separate, separate uh, specific interest. Whereas, however, we all manage all the trauma. And I thank all my colleagues for giving these uh, excellent lectures. And a special thanks to you as well as Farid for coming over and spending the three hours with us. I thank you all. And more importantly, I have admiration for Ashok Sham. So he has put in this ortho TV and then it has reached so many people. And then I think it is a phenomenal work by ortho TV for educating everybody. I thank Ashok Sham and the entire team there who are uh, with us today. And I thank you all. I thank all those people who have been uh, listening to us in this webinar. I thank you all. Thank you, Farid, again. So. Thank you, Dr. Thank, thank, thank you, you all of you. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you again, Devendra. Thank you, Dr. Didi. Thank you. Thank and please uh, thank, thank uh, Dr. Raj Sekaran for me. Sure, sure. Um, um, sorry, it's uh, we're reaching midnight here, so I think it's time for me to have a shower, go to sleep, and I need to be at work at 7 a.m. sharp. So yeah, yeah. That's why I uh, thought we should I, end. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Bye.